And now, please welcome The Atlantic's Margaret Lowe. Good morning, good morning, and welcome. I'm Margaret Lowe, the president of Atlantic Live, the team behind this festival, and I'm so happy to see all of you back again as day two gets underway. We have a power-packed morning ahead at this very newsy moment. Re Republican Senator Mitt Romney will be here. We'll explore, le we'll explore leadership with a lineup of CEOs, and we're gonna cover everything from the future of free speech to the future of flight. So buckle up for a very exciting ride. Uh, first, a few important shout outs. My thanks to our partners and friends at the Aspen Institute and to all of our underwriters who make this entire festival possible. They are AFLAC, Allstate, the Association of American Medical Colleges, Bayer, Booz Allen Hamilton, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser and the Government of the District of Columbia, ExxonMobil, Facebook, Horizon Therapeutics, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, PayPal, Pfizer, Pharma, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, United Airlines, and U.S. Bank. Thank you all so much. Now, please, as you always hear us say, silence your cell phones, but keep them close to join the conversation on Twitter. Use the hashtag Atlantic, the Atlantic Fest. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to remember journalist Cokie Roberts, who died last week. Complications from breast cancer. She was 75. I, I, I love that picture of Cokie behind a microphone, not only because it's a beautiful photo, but because Koki spent so much of her life talking with America, explaining this country to itself, unpacking Washington politics for millions of people across generations, at ABC News and at NPR, where she was known as one of the founding mothers. And that's where I was lucky enough to get to know her and learn from her. She taught us what was possible for women in newsrooms. She was revered and she was adored. Koki like Madonna or Beyonce, required no less name. Though, her given name was Mary Martha Corinne Morrison Claiborne Boggs. <laughs> but her big brother Tommy couldn't pronounce Corinne, so Koki she became. She brought fierce intelligence and a deep understanding of politics and the wider world to her reporting. Her delivery was unmistakable, her voice captivating, her words precise and powerful, and sometimes just plain lyrical. You could hear the Southern influence in her rich storytelling. She was from New Orleans, after all. She was also a lovely human being in every way, warm, generous, genuinely interested in others. I realize, looking back, that her values are totally ingrained in me. She once said, don't get all involved in the politics of your institution. Just do your work and get it on the air, and then people will see that you're good. Koki left an indelible mark on a whole generation of women journalists and on the country. I always thought she was invincible. One of her best friends, NPR's Supreme Court reporter Nina Totenberg, went to see Koki in the hospital. It was the night before she died. Nina said goodbye and told Koki that she would see her on the other side, at that big broadcasting studio somewhere, and that she would still be a star. I have no doubt. Koki led the way for people like NPR's Mary Louise Kelly, the All Things Considered host who will lead our next conversation with a woman who has also become a star in a surprising Broadway hit. For that, please welcome Heidi Schreck, the playwright of what the Constitution means to me, timely today, indeed. Please, Thank good morning, you. everybody. Welcome, Heidi Schreck. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Could you give me here. a minute just to say a quick coda to what Margaret Please. just said about Koki? Please, I would love to Koki, hear more about Koki. <laughs> who did indeed pave the way for me and so many other women at NPR. And I was listening to Margaret just there and thinking, the thing about Koki 
was she was a superb journalist. She was also a mom. And she never made it look easy to do both, but she did, as another former colleague said, she made it look possible. And I watched that and thought, well, hell, if she can do it, I can at least try. <laughs> and she would be so damn proud to see the two of us up here today with you, Broadway superstar. Um, for those of you who don't know, Heidi was nominated for not one, but, not two, but two Tonys this year, Best Play and Best Actress. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize this year for drama. I watched her bring... I know. I watched her bring the house down at the Kennedy Center on Saturday night. You're having a heck of a year. I, it's a big Does year. it feel real? Uh, no, it doesn't quite feel real. I feel like I've woken up from a very strange dream, actually. I just I did my final performance on Sunday after performing the show for about two years. So it's been very interesting. Well, congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank I mean, you. I want us, for those who haven't seen the play, just situate us. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the play, which began with a series of speeches you gave for prize money, speeches about the Constitution back when you were 15 years old? Uh, yes, yeah. so when I was 15, um, uh, my mom came to me and said, you know, I have this contest you're gonna do so that you can earn money for college. <laughs> and I said, okay, mom. Uh, and so I spent the next, well, I, yeah, I guess all of my high school years uh, traveling the country, giving speeches about the Constitution at American Legion Halls for scholarship money. Um, and I was actually able to pay for my entire college education this way. Uh, wow. Yes, I, I mean, <laughs> to be clear, it was, it was 30 years ago, it was a state college, but, <laughs> but yes, I was able to do that. And uh, I also, you know, it was a really formative um, part of my life. I fell in love with U.S. history because of it. I fell in love with the Constitution. I was a very idealistic teenage girl. And I also, um, I learned how to speak in front of people and to trust my own uh, mind and my own voice. So yeah. um, about 12 years ago, I thought it, it might be interesting to go back to that time period since it, um, it was so transformational for me and see if I could make a piece of theater about that time, which is how this play came to be. And you, took it to Broadway. I can't imagine what got you thinking this might be an opportune moment for a play about the Constitution. Um, but was there a catalyst where you thought, okay, I, this, this is the moment to launch this baby really into the world? Uh, so I've been performing pieces of it for about a decade. Um, I first performed it in 2015, a very different moment uh, in, in many ways. Uh, but I... Uh, and then in, in 2016, a friend of mine who runs a theater came to me and said, I think this is the right time to do this play. And uh, I, I agreed with her. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to let people get a little bit of a taste because we've got a clip of sure. some of you performing. This is a section of the play focusing on the Ninth Amendment. Yes. Which, had you asked me before, I would have been hard-pressed to tell you what the Ninth <laughs> Amendment is. It's your favorite, I gather. Well, it was my favorite at 15. Okay. So the clip you'll see is, is the 15-year-old me, not me now. Okay, let's... My favorite now is the 14th Amendment. The so, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to watch this clip, and then, we'll, and then I'll follow on that. Great. Amendment 9 says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Do you know what this means? It means just because a certain right is not listed in the Constitution, it doesn't mean you don't have that right. The fact is, there was no way for the framers to put down every single right we have. I mean, the right to brush your teeth, yes, you've got it, but how long do we want this document to be? Here's another example. When I was a little girl, I had an imaginary friend named Reba McIntyre. She was not related to the singer. Just because the Constitution does not proclaim the having of imaginary friends as one of my rights does not mean I can be thrown in jail for being friends with Reba McIntyre. Isn't that amazing? Think about it for a moment. Our Constitution doesn't tell you all the rights that you have because it doesn't know. <laughs> I love that. The whole, because it doesn't know, it speaks to this old 
you know, document that was written more than 200 years ago that yes. should be so fusty and musty. And you're speaking to the messy, living, just aliveness of it now. Yes. Yeah. I think at 15, that amendment, I remember being just fascinated by that amendment because first of all, it's true. Actually, nobody knows what it means, really. I mean, you know, Scalia famously said he never studied it in law school and that he couldn't tell you what it meant if his life depended on it, um, which his didn't, although women's lives ended up depending on it. But I'll get to that later. But, uh, uh, but I found it so mysterious at 15. Like, like what does it mean? What are the other rights that... Um, that, the constitu that, that I have that I don't know about. And I think I saw it as a teenage girl as a way to, to think about the future. Like how, like wh what are the things about myself I don't know yet? Uh, what are the, yeah. the things um, that might be waiting for me in the future that I don't understand? And I do say another thing in the play, which is like Amendment 9 sort of says that uh, who we are now might not be who we will become. It leaves a little room for the future self which is what I loved about it. Now, to be clear, I'm not sure that's exactly what the framers intended. <laughs> uh, they really, it was a much more practical amendment, I think. They, they put it in there to make sure that since they had enumerated rights in the Bill of Rights, they wanted to make sure that no one interpreted that as, as saying, like, these are the only rights you have. Right. It was a little bit just to cover their asses. Um, but for me as <laughs> the a Ninth Amendment to cover your ass basically. amendment. Basically. But for yeah, me as a 15-year-old, it, it was quite poetic and yeah. felt like a very existential amendment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just before we move on, you've, you've now decided your loyalties have switched to the 14th Amendment? Yeah, I am absolutely, I think the 14th Amendment is the most powerful amendment we have. Which, it contains, well, it, it repeats the due process clause of the 15th Amendment. It contains equal protection under the law, uh, birthright citizenship. Um, uh, it's just, yeah, it's a very important amendment. Um, I, I will say that I did discover then when I was in my 30s, when I started making this play, I discovered how important the Ninth Amendment had actually been to um, women's reproductive freedom, which is something I didn't know as a teenager. And part of me wonders if my teenage self was sort of intuiting something about this amendment. Um, so once I started really studying uh, and researching um, so, so that I could make the play, I learned that the Ninth Amendment had been fundamental in Griswold versus Connecticut, which many of you know is. Uh, is the decision in 1965 that finally made birth control legal in all, yeah. all states, yes. Uh, it was still technically illegal in Connecticut, uh, and this incredible woman, Estelle Griswold, uh, challenged that law, um, faced a year in prison, and the, the justices, who were, who were nine men, of course, um, uh, clearly wanted to to decide in favor of birth control. Everybody was using it. Like, we all knew that, you know, it should be legal. They all knew it should be legal. But um, they had a hard time finding a constitutional basis for it. So William O. Douglas took the Ninth Amendment, this amendment that says, oh, there are other rights lurking in the, in the shadows of the Constitution that we don't know about. And he used the First, Third, and Fourth Amendments to say, one of those rights is the right to privacy, right. which is the first time the right to privacy um, became named, uh, and he said that this allows um, basically a woman to put in an IUD as long as she's married and as long as her husband says that it's okay. <laughs> Progress. You're, you're, you're leading me up to a big thing I want to ask about yes. in the play. It's so much is about women. Yes. and women's lives and women's rights and your own family. Yes. And try, you wrestling with what the Constitution actually says and what your family was actually experiencing. Would you tell us about your grandma, Betty? Sure. Yes, I would be happy to. Um, let me say, first of all, that um, the, the guiding principle of the play was to um, take the prompt of the original contest seriously. So when I was 15, they said, to win this contest, you need to find a personal connection between your life and the document, which at 15, I just spouted a lot of platitudes. Um, and I decided what would happen if, now that I'm an adult and have much more life experience, if I took that question seriously. So um, I started looking into my own 
So I started with my own body, which is how I got to birth control and also abortion. Um, and then I started looking into the history of my family. Um, and I have a history of um, physical and sexual violence in my family. I, I didn't grow up with it, thank God, but um, my mom did, my grandma. Um, and so I started researching cases that had to do with that, with domestic violence, with sexual assault toward women. And I, I started to realize how, um, how unprotected the women in my family had been, uh, how the laws had failed them. And in my opinion, um, the Constitution had failed them. Yeah. You've talked about how when you first performed those parts of the play, you couldn't get through them. Like you, had to, you had to walk off. I mean, it's, I yeah. guess it speaks to, this stuff is hard to wrestle with, even if it was your mom and your grandmom and not you, and it doesn't get easier even if you've gone yes. and written a lovely play about it. No, that was, um, that was a fascinating moment, actually, because I grew up, my mom's a very outspoken feminist and outspoken about her, about being a survivor. She, I grew up watching her support you know, in the 1980s, support other young women who were coming out uh, with um, their experiences, uh, uh, experiences of sexual abuse. So I knew that it was an important thing to talk about. I knew that, um, uh, that my mom was very, that she did not feel it was something that she should be ashamed for, that, that the, in her case, man who perpetrated the abuse is the person who should be ashamed. And, and so I felt very confident that I could tell these stories and, and understand why it was important to tell them. But as soon as I, the first night I stepped on stage to tell that story, I just uh, panicked and I actually walked off stage, which I've never done. I've been a stage actor for 20 years. Um, I don't, I don't get, I get a little scared, but not scared like that. So I, I left the stage uh, my director came back, uh, my husband came back and said, you know, there are a lot of women out there who, who need you to tell this story. You need to go back out. So uh, the audience is still seeing. They were sitting out waiting. there, yeah. <laughs> they were taking a little break, yeah. yeah. I promise I won't leave this time. <laughs> I, uh, and then my husband gave me a small glass of tequila and I went back out. <laughs> <laughs> Husbands are good for things. He's like that. great. I have yeah. an amazing husband. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so connect this back. How does yeah. every the, the trauma your family has been through? How do you how did you, how did you connect that to the Constitution? Well, it's interesting because I um, I just started. I I thought, okay, what are the Supreme Court cases that have had. Um, that are about uh, domestic violence, that are about violence against women. And the first um, case I discovered was a case called um, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, um, which is a very heartbreaking case about um, a woman, Jessica Gonzalez, who, in the, um, who had gotten a restraining order against her violent husband. This was in the um, late 90s. I believe the case happened in 2005, the Supreme Court case, but I, I believe the what the, the tragedy happened in the 90s. So she had gotten a restraining order. Her husband was stalking her, threatening to kill her, threatening to kill their children. Um, and he kidnapped their three daughters. She went to the police. She said, I have a restraining order. Co Colorado at that time had a, a mandatory law that said uh, that it was mandatory for police to arrest a person who had violated a protective order. The police refused to help her. She called seven times, she went twice in person, she showed them the restraining order, they refused to look for him. Uh, and then that night he, he actually legally purchased a gun while his daughters were waiting in the car and then killed them. Uh, it was, it's a horrific story. Uh, Jessica, who I've become friends with, I feel very lucky to know, uh, very bravely decided to sue the police department. This case escalated, went all the way to the Supreme Court and this court in a seven to two decision uh, led by Justice Scalia, said that she was not entitled to sue the police for their inaction. Um, the case eventually escalated to the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and that commission said that the United States had violated Jessica's rights, um, her, her human rights. Um, the case is complicated. There are people who say it wasn't argued well or it wasn't argued under the right 
it was ar argued under the due process clause of a, a property interest of the 14th Amendment. Um, there are people who say that the court ignored the larger context of the case, the fact that many states have been passing these laws because the problem of violence against women in this country is in fact epidemic, and that they had instead focused on a very legalistic, you know, tiny phrase, which is does the police, the police shall enforce a restraining order. Does, does shall actually mean must, or does it mean maybe? <laughs> uh, so anyway, the case is quite complicated, but I realized at that point that whatever, whatever your feelings about that decision, the fact that it was so difficult to, to bring about what, in yeah. my opinion, is a just outcome, which is that, of course, of course she was, the police failed her. Of course we need better protections for women in this country. Four women are killed every day in this country by a male partner. Um, the, the fact that the Constitution didn't uh, allow a way to address that um, just made me realize how, how unprotected the women in my family had been. Yeah. Yeah. What's it been like to perform the play in Washington in 2019? I mean, a couple blocks from the Supreme Court, but also as we're watching this constitutional clash play out between the executive branch and Congress. I mean, Nancy Pelosi was sitting yesterday right, here? right where you were wow. sitting <laughs> a couple hours before she announced, before she announced wow. impeachment inquiry. Um, it has been uh, fascinating to perform it here. I will say, um, you know, to do it, to, Performed this play at the Kennedy Center and with uh, and the and in this city with the historical significance of this city has has felt very powerful. Yeah. Um, I will also say DC audiences are the only audiences who will applaud for like a little clause of an amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I couldn't. The first night I couldn't get through just reciting the the first section of the Fourteenth Amendment because they were so excited about every clause. I was like, all right. <laughs> Um, so that was fun. It was actually fun to perform and exciting to perform for an audience of people who, who knew on a deeper, more nuanced level some of yeah. the cases I was discussing, some of the things I was talking about. That was exciting. Do you know if any of the Supreme Court justices came to see it? Uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor came uh, to Broadway. They came to New York, yeah. And, um, is that terrifying to perform a play about the Constitution? That was in front of them? the most terrified I've ever been on stage. Like a double tequila before you go on stage. Kind I, of uh, I actually I learned that Justice Ginsburg was coming about a half hour before I went on stage, and I just took out my script and like tried to re fact check everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the most incredible thing is then. She was lovely, she came back saying she was so lovely to our teenage debaters. I have two teenage debaters in the show um, who at that time were ages 14 and 17 and she really encouraged them to make it to the Supreme Court one day which I was very excited about. Yeah. Um, and then she asked me for a copy of the script um, and I was like, oh, I don't want to send her a copy of the script. She's gonna see everything that's wrong with it. Um, <laughs> Uh, my stage manager said, oh, Heidi, she's too busy to read your script, don't worry. And I was like, right. So I sent it to her with a nice thank you card, and you know, it was just like a symbolic gift. And then three days later, I got a FedEx <laughs> thanking me for the script and making two small suggestions <laughs> that were... Did you take them? Oh, of course I took them, <laughs> yes. Yes, I took them. Uh, no, they were, you know, and one of them Was had, it like legalese, just tiny things she think well, you could get better? I mean, one or? of them had to do with yeah. changing the word um, um, could to might, might have, you know, could have to might have. It had to do with like, I was making an assertion that I don't, I think she felt couldn't completely be backed up. Right. And so she wanted me to be clearer, which I appreciated. And... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, they were, they were like that. They were very detailed. I was incredibly grateful. I, I framed the letter. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, in the few seconds we have left, would you just tell us where the play goes next? Because you, I mean, this is a play that's yes. your life in the Constitution. You're stepping out of the title role, and it's going to go am. on the road all over the country. What happens? Um, 
Yeah, so the play will be traveling, I, I think right now we have around 20 cities um, uh, booked and um, someone will be playing me. So I have a tremendous, we've cast an incredible actress, I can't name her yet, but um, we will be going into rehearsal in December to kind of, she will play me, but we'll reshape the play a little bit so that at some point she can share something uh, uh, something about her own life in relationship to the Constitution. Okay. So, right. yeah. So a living, breathing, a living, play, about breathing a living, breathing play. Yeah. Heidi Schreck, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, for our conversation on free speech and the internet, please welcome the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, with Atlantic staff writer, Alexis Madrigal. Hello. Um, so I'm a firm believer that sometimes the dumbest questions yield uh, the best answers. Uh, and we're gonna test that theory out right off the top here. Um, what is YouTube? <laughs> I mean, in a serious way, though. Like, yeah. how, how do you think of it now? Yeah. Um, well, great first question. Um, <laughs> so we think about YouTube, and our goal with YouTube is to be the best video service um, and have the largest collection of videos where our users can come and not just watch videos, but also engage with videos, and also be a place where anyone can upload, have a global audience, and potentially turn their passion into a business. So what I'm hearing is it's a sort of a, a global collection of videos, and it's also uh, a media service, uh, like a platform. Yes, so we, I mean, over the years, YouTube has accumulated an incredible library of videos. And we have all kinds of videos, probably every speech. We probably have previous speeches from here. Um, we have an incredible how-to library, so people all over come and tell me things that they learned on YouTube, from how to fix their ice maker to they learned the My language. My water heater. Right. Their water yeah. heater, everything um, you can learn on YouTube. In fact, I had this problem, the pump on my pool wasn't working, which is, and I called them, how do you fix this? And they were like, we actually have a YouTube video to fix it. So <laughs> it's like, okay, I should have thought about that. Um, so we have this incredible collection of videos, and so our goal is to keep building this incredible collection. And I think what's really unique about YouTube and having been an online um, platform is that we've been able to create these new genres. So if you look at traditional media, uh, you know, we, there were a limited number of channels. And when you have a limited number of channels, you're always going to focus on what is content that's going to appeal to the broadest set of people. But when you have uh, you know, millions of channels, you can have millions of different topics that you cover. And those topics can range on anything from woodworking to Pilates to, like, how to raise chickens. And so our... Um, ability to ha to have these new genres of how to gaming is really big right. on YouTube. We have fashion and beauty on YouTube. Um, we have highlights of everything, and so it's just this incredible collection of videos, and it's been accumulated because so many people have been able to contribute to that library, and because people who will have taken their passions will. You know, they'll start just uploading one video, and then they'll wind up realizing, oh, look, there's a lot of people who are interested in this. Um, so, for example, we, we know this family, the McKnight family, and they have six kids, and they, the mom would do these incredible hairstyles of, like, different braids, you know, braids on the left, braids in the back. Like, mm -hmm. everyone always wonders, how do you do these braids? And so she would film herself doing the kids' braids, and then she would post it on YouTube, and she intended just for other people at the school to see them. So she showed it to them. And then she realized that uh, people all over the world were looking at these braids. And there was actually a really big audience for, for braids. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, because I mean, they're hard to do right, and you right. need to see it. And you can't really read a book to figure out how to do that braid. And so they now have, um, now it's a family business. Um, everyone in their, their, the husband has quit his job. Um, full-time braider. It's a yeah. full-time, um, and they have over 5 million subscribers, and then it turned out the kids who were having their hair braided, you never actually saw them 
in the videos, um, they're, they're now in college, but it turns out they're twins. There are actually two of them, Brooklyn and Bailey, and then they wound up having their own channel, and they also have millions of subscribers now, too. So I think what's interesting is that you kind of slid from one way that I think about YouTube, which is as this, yeah, almost uh, limitless archive of like cultural production of, of all different kinds, historical, contemporary, and other things, and then this other version of YouTube, which is like the stars, which is like the, the tiny sliver of people who become basically professionals um, in this. And I'm, I'm curious if you see those two things as, as being in tension, like the global catalog of video and this fairly concentrated um, set of people who see themselves uh, as the creator community. Mm -hmm. well, well, so I think if you look at the evolution of YouTube, it started out where people would have just uploaded a video of something they saw in their life um, that was interesting, like, you know, tr like just the kind of quintessential cats on skateboards, right? It started with that. But right. then people, there were mo people like the McKnights that I talked about that realized, wow, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole business here. Um, and then there were people who wound up having literally millions and millions of subscribers. And um, these are really, I would say, some of the biggest influencers today in culture. And they're what's driving our culture in so many different ways. And, um, and um, it, it makes sense because if you, you know, we have, YouTube has over 2 billion people who are coming to YouTube every month who are logged in. And um, these stars are building really next generation media companies. They might start out building in their, filming in their bedroom, um, but now they have, as they have millions of subscribers, they're coming from all over the globe, they have a global brand. Um, a lot of times that they, they have people who are helping them, so they're providing jobs, they have a merchandise line usually. Right. Um, and so I think about this concept of creators really as next generation media companies. Um, and if you look at pretty much every country of the world, you're gonna see a significant number of these creators who are creating jobs and creating content. And it's, it's different than traditional media companies, right? Which had an editor and producer, um, and there were a limited number of them. You know, here, you can really have an unlimited number of them, and they're the ones who are controlling the content and what makes sense for them. Yeah. I mean, I think what kind of bound together, you kind of have these different groups, right? Because you sort of have the creators, you have like YouTube corporate, you have the people who are watching the videos, um, and then uh, you have um, the, the advertisers who are yeah. kind of like powering all this. And what held them all together sort of was this idea that it was a, a platform. And one of the things I think is interesting is over the last few years, I think lots of people here have probably um, notice that kind of that idea has started to break down a little bit. Like, can something be a platform um, without much more content moderation than it seemed like was going to be uh, in play? And I'm curious what, how you feel YouTube's role has changed as mm -hmm. a platform, you know, say in the last three years. Mm -hmm. it, in the last three years, probably the biggest change that we have made has been that we have been significantly tightening the policies that the platform runs on. Um, and so I think the ecosystem that you described is consistent. Um, it's grown significantly in terms of the number of users. Um, our creators that, that I think about as, as really next generation media companies and businesses, and then of course advertisers that have also continued to grow. Um, and what we've seen is that because of the, of the scale and the, res the responsibility that we see that we have with the platform, we have really had to lean in a lot more to coming up with the right policies that make sense. Uh, and um, we actually call those the four R's, um, the four R's of responsibility in terms of how we um, remove content. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have made, in, since 2018, we have made 48 policy changes or changes to enforcement. Um, and those are significant because every time we make a change that needs to be rolled out and it mm -hmm. needs to be done consistently across all of our reviewers and uh, across, um, consistently across all different types of videos. We both, we remove content. Um, we are focused on raising up authoritative information. If it is news or medical or sensitive information, um, 
if we have borderline content, our focus is to, that's the third R, is to reduce that. Huh. Um, and how then, do you define borderline content? Yeah, how do we define borderline content? We have, um, well, first of all, we, we have policies, and we have a set of reviewers. Those re reviewers are um, distributed around, um, they're specific for every country, and they're distributed geographically, so we get a good representation of everyone in the US. Um, and those reviewers are asked to look at a number of videos, and they have a number of questions around them, so, like, do they see this as, as potentially harmful? Um, do they see this as, you know, we have a bunch of questions, um, and we actually release the guidelines to our reviewers, so we're public about what those guidelines are. And then based on that, we determine a set of videos that we think are borderline, and then we use machine learning to learn from that. So there's been a lot of questions, you know, mostly for other uh, platforms, Facebook most notably, yes. about the actual, like the, the, the real process of, of reviewing and sort of the, the human beings who are doing yes. that reviewing. Yes. Um, so a lot of those questions, which I'd like to put to you are, you know, how many of those people are contractors and sort of what are the conditions under which those people are working? Because we know in some cases people have had maybe a yeah. few seconds to review content, yeah. and just sort of the system itself seems designed to fail. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd say we've taken that incredibly seriously, and, and um, you know, we, we all review videos. I'll say I've been personally very involved in reviewing our, our videos, <laughs> um, and when we make a policy change, I, we're going to review lots and lots of videos around that policy area. So first of all, our executives, our, our legal, our policy, um, we're all seeing a lot of those videos too. But mm -hmm. to be able to scale it, it goes out to our reviewers, most of whom are contractors. And Google has over 10,000 people who are focused on controversial content. Uh, so I thought it was really important to make sure I had an understanding of what those work conditions were like. And so I have been to a few locations where we have most of our reviewers on that. And I've sat down with the reviewers. I've met the people. I've sat in the queues. I've seen the work that they do. Mm -hmm. you know, we've gone through different videos. Um, and we've done a number of different steps to, to make sure that it's a, it's a really positive environment. Like, um, they review videos for five hours a day, but then they have the other three hours to do other types of work around the office. <laughs> and when you talk to those people, the, the one, they feel that they are doing a really important mission, which is helping keep the internet a safe place. And so we, we talk a lot about that. We provide all the additional services, any kind of counseling, ability to take a break, um, and, and um, other services. Actually, when I went to visit one site, I left my bag in a location, and when I came back, they were doing Zumba um, in, the, in, the, in the room. And so it's just an example of the types of services that we offer. Um, you know, we all know that, because give us a, a sense of like the scale of like how many hours of video are being uploaded yeah. per second or per minute. It's a ton, right? Yeah, so YouTube has 500 hours uploaded every minute to YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a lot of video. And again, that's how we build an incredible library that has pretty much anything, everything, right. um, anything you want to learn. Um, but it also means that to be able to manage that with the policies and to enforce that consistently, you really need to have a process and you need to use a combination of machines and people to be able to make that happen. So I think one question, because of that scale, you can't have human reviewers do it all, and so you are going to use these machine learning tools that make decisions based on the decisions humans made. What can you tell us about the signals that those algorithms use? Like, do we know why that system ends up flagging future videos based on you know, what human reviewers did? Like, how, how explicable uh, are those decisions, both internally and, and externally? So, so, whenever we, so whenever we have a policy, we announce what that policy is, we make sure that the policy can be interpreted by thousands of reviewers all over the globe in the same way. Um, and that takes many trials, so we'll do a policy, we'll roll it out, we'll see, can reviewers consistently um, give us the same ratings 
for those videos. And so sometimes a policy will need to go back multiple times to be able to make sure that the human reviewers can do it consistently. Um, but basically, the way the machine learning works, just to give the, yeah. the maybe the 20 second version of something that's pretty complicated, is we will identify well, what we do is we um, build first a set of videos. So let's say we're making a policy around, um, I don't know, it could be you know, any area, like um, a, maybe we could choose. Uh, I don't know. Nazis. Um, I mean, it, we're, we're talking about the internet, so Nazis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Violent extremism yeah. or, or hate or something. So you identify. So you create a set of videos um, that are that you know are the types of videos that are problematic, and and then you have what we call machine learning, and the machine learning goes out on the internet, and it, it's you can think about it as like casting a net, and so it casts a net to try to find all the videos that are like these videos. Um, and it doesn't do a perfect job. It doesn't find every single one. It doesn't mean that just because it found it, it really is violative. Um, but what it does is it, we take that net of content and then we give that to human reviewers. Mm -hmm. And the human reviewers go through it with the policy and we make sure that they can do that consistently. Yeah. And the machines keep getting better and better, which means they're, they're gonna find more and more of it. They're gonna do so at a higher accuracy rate. Because then once you have, once the humans have told us, oh yes, these are really violative, right. you have a you larger collection, the yeah. and the machines will become smarter and smarter. So given, even given that, with the kind of scale that we're talking about, the system will, will make mistakes at times. Sure. The human and, and machine system together will, sure. will make mistakes. So how do you define sort of an acceptable failure rate, and what do you think the consequences should be when it, when a decision goes wrong? Well, well, we work hard to do this at a very high level of accuracy. Um, and so, I mean, different, I'll say different policies have to, can have different levels, right? So child safety, that's one where we're gonna say we need to be right all the time and we need to try to find every single example that we think is problematic. Um, we tell our advertisers for brand safety that we operate at 99%, and we say that because we want to, um, you know, brand safety, again, is an example where what's safe for one advertiser might not be safe for another advertiser, and um, there's some variance there. But, uh, but in general, like, we try to do this at as at high a level as we possibly can. Um, so yesterday on the stage, uh, Facebook's Nick Clegg said that his company had sort of a different and I, a lot of people interpret it as looser standard for politicians mm -hmm. um, on their platforms. Yeah. Um, do you think that politicians should have different standards um, on YouTube than, than other content creators because of the sort of specific nature of their speech? Yeah. I, you know, so politicians are... You know, of course, are democratically elected, at least in, in most countries. And there is, um, it's important for that content to be seen. So, you know, in general, actually, when we make policies, we have, in most cases, what we call an EDSA exception, which would be educational, documentary, scientific, or artistic. And so that would be the type of content that we would say doesn't always meet that same criteria. Um, so when you have a, a political officer that is making information that is really important for the constituents to see or for other global leaders to see, that is content um, that, we would, that we would leave up because we think it's important for other people to see. Um, one, one, thing, one important distinction I'll say is that, uh, look, even, even if we were to take it down, it would be covered by all the news stories. And, um, the news is always going to provide that information and they're going to provide it with context. So even if we take something down, a lot of that's controversial, it's often covered by the press, um, but then it has the context around it of like, this is why we left it up, this is what we think about this event that happened with a politician. Um, so you were at Google basically from its inception. Yes. Um, what do you think that Google brought to and did to YouTube when it acquired it fairly early in its life in the mid-2000s? Oh. Oh. Well, you know, so first of all, I was involved in the acquisition of, of YouTube. Um, I saw it very early on that this was something that was going to be really big. And really what I saw was the fact that I saw, I saw two things, which is that 
people wanted to tell their story. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Like, we would just have like a website and say, upload your videos. And like, all these people would upload their <laughs> videos. And they would be you know, people sharing things about their lives. Like, why they wanted to share it was unclear. Um, but, <laughs> but lots of people want to tell their story. And I think like, you, know, you can actually think that that's a pretty predictable um, part of human nature. But the, what really surprised me is that other people wanted to hear those stories. And that other people wanted to connect with people like them. Um, and I think there's something really human about it. So right away, I saw there was this huge opportunity. Um, Google acquired YouTube for $1.65 billion, which at the time was seen as an incredible mm -hmm. amount of money. And I remember right, be right before we acquired them, Mark Cuban wrote this article that said, only a moron would acquire YouTube. And then like the next <laughs> week, Google bought YouTube. Um, and when we bought YouTube, you have to realize, too, the reason YouTube sold is because it was going to require a lot more investments, both from a um, the huge amount of growth of networking, machines, et cetera, but also the legal battle. battle. So soon afterwards, uh, we were, YouTube was sued by Viacom, and Google had to invest a significant amount. Um, we wound up winning, winning that lawsuit, but it was, it was an investment yeah. that Google made, and I think it was a combination of investment, um, providing some of the technology that Google has, mm -hmm. and then also letting YouTube just be YouTube. Huh. So do you think YouTube should be spun out of now Alphabet? Uh, so I, I don't think so, um, personally. I, you know, our focus is really just on serving the constituents that you said. Uh, um, I'm really focused on responsibility. I'm focused on uh, the four R's that I talked about. And thinking about all the different ways we would have to separate from Alphabet is, is really not high on my priority list. Um, I really want to focus on getting the policies right and getting the implementation right and building a great library of content for our users and building businesses. Uh, we use technology from Google that's really helpful, like all the machine learning that I talked about, mm -hmm. being able to find the policies, being able to find the, the violative content, being able to do that at scale. We benefit from the Google technology that's there. So it would be, it, I, I mean, I don't think it would have any benefit for consumers if we were spun out. Um, you've been uh, a big advocate for greater diversity in tech. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, every time I look at the progress reports, you know, it's like 1% a year change for, for <laughs> most companies would be considered good. Um, how, do you, how do you see that fight, you know, maybe really five, six years since it started to heat up? I think it's a long term, you have to have a long term perspective on it. And if you look at it over the long term, I actually just looked at the computer science numbers and the number of people who are studying computer science, and there was, there's tremendous progress. Uh, so I, I, First of all, I think it's incredibly important. And the reason I do is because technology is one of the most important forces of change in our society right now. And if you say this is an industry that is changing so many other industries, and this industry is filled up with a select set of people that excludes so many others, that's a problem. You're not going to have um, the best ideas. You're not going to be represented. Those other, those other minority groups are going to be excluded and not have the same advantages. So I think it's incredibly important to have diversity in tech. And I, the, the only way to address it is to, to think about this as long term, that you're consistently trying to bring more women in, into tech. and then the women that are in tech, that you're doing your best to retain them, provide opportunities for them. And it has to, it has to come from the top down. Um, so I wrote this article for Vanity Fair called How to Break Up the Silicon Valley Boys Club. And um, it really was, I, I realized after I wrote, I was really addressing it to the other leaders of Silicon Valley that they needed to take responsibility for it and mm -hmm. they needed to change their cultures and have the right recruiting and retention for all different types of underrepresented people in, in tech. Yeah. And do you think that's working, though? Do you think people are, are paying attention? Slowly. I think it's working, but slowly. I mean, I wish, it, I, wish I could say it's, it, it's happening faster. Yeah. It is happening, but it's, it's slow. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your competitors quite broadly here. Sure. Um, in between, say, you know, Facebook video, Netflix, Instagram, TikTok, is there anything on those other platforms that makes you jealous that you go, oh, I wish we had more of that? Oh, well, I mean, I think, first of all, it's an incredible time to be in video. It's, it's, I don't think we've ever seen this much content being created um, and this much change in how we watch video. And 
I think in a sense we all are in different parts. I mean, the way I think about it is there's a, a lot of people who are competing for the head content. Um, and there's a lot of people competing for the user-generated content. Uh, so um, we compete with Twitch, for example, who's owned by Amazon for live streaming, which has been a really important area. Um, Facebook and Instagram are in video. They have, um, I mean, Instagram has, a, a lot of YouTube stars are on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They're doing stories. And then you know, TikTok, I mean, it's pretty incredible. TikTok is a company that you know, a year ago wasn't on our radar. Now it's on everybody's radar. Right. Um, and they're doing super, super short videos with music and, and different templated content. And so I think, um, sure, I'd love to do all of it, but just the section that we're in, which is this user-generated, but I'd say pro, pro next generation media companies, pro UGC is also what some people call it, um, mm -hmm. YouTube influencer stars, like that area in itself is so big and so important. Um, I really want to make sure that we don't lose focus on what we do well. Yeah. And last question, when will people stop watching regular old linear television? You know, I think we sometimes forget how much TV has changed. So just, just literally last week, I was cleaning out my basement, and I found this TV from when I was little. And I was almost embarrassed to show it to my kids because, first of all, it was black and white. Um, second of all, it had this dial um, where you change the channels, and it was hard-coded. It only went up to channel, I think, 68 or... 74 and, and yeah. you would have to, you know, it was analog click, and click, click, click. It wasn't yeah. just click, 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 but there were like three different areas. It was like channel one to seven, channel seven to 14, <laughs> channel 14 to 68. It was hard code. There's no more channels than 68 on there. Yeah. My kids had no idea how to use it, right? They were like, yeah. oh, does it actually turn on? Like they were so confused. <laughs> um, um, and so, sorry, what was your question? Again? Yeah, so I, when people <laughs> will stop watching television. I mean, I yeah. think if you look at this next generation, a lot of the next generation already has. Um, and th they have, well, what they've opted for is they've opted for uh, OTT solution. I mean, you can look at the number of, the number of cable nevers, top, cable yeah. cutters. I mean, it's basically a, a, a sharp drop off, right, yeah. of people who are not subscribing to, to TV. And I think if you look at this next generation, they will say, why, why should I wait for a show to be on at six? Like, I could just see it all now on this OTT platform. I can see it on my phone. I can, so I think there is a very significant generational focus on um, moving to OTT platforms, and it, it, it will just continue. And you look at the TV providers themselves, and they're also switching to OTT. I mean, NBC has Peacock. Disney's coming out with Disney+. Plus. Um, CBS, CBS All Access. So you look at the, the providers, they're all switching to OTT, I think, and that's what the users expect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
Oscar Munoz, you may have heard shortly after he took the job, you suffered a major heart attack and you had a heart transplant. Um, a lot of forgot people may be thinking, you forgot about that. Uh, talk about, uh, how, first of all, how are you doing and how did that experience change you? Uh, okay, I'm doing great. It didn't, I, I've always been who I am and I've checked with many people before and after. Uh, I do spend a lot of time on a serious, it's a, it's a horrible disease. It's the largest killer in America by far. And it's mostly because symptoms are, are many and varied for both men and women. And uh, for a lot of reasons, people just sort of don't uh, pay attention to those things. And in my particular case, luckily I had some friends that I did uh, marathons with, and I was a vegan on top of that. So your lifestyle, while helpful, is not everything. There's a lot of hereditary. Uh, and so knowing symptoms, and more importantly, if you ever feel anything that's sort of different, strange, weird, call 911. Um, it's, you know, the worst you can be is embarrassed, and the best you can be is alive. And somebody told me that one time, and when I felt something interesting and weird, I called 911, and in 38 minutes I was on life support, and you know, a couple months later I had a brand new heart. And uh, so uh, telling that story to folks and making sure that they act on their symptoms is important, A. B, I think the other thing that's changed in my life is I get a chance to go talk to people who have had the same situation. And uh, uh, there's nothing better than someone in a, in a bed thinking they're 60 and someone like me up and around, uh, and I think, uh, I think that's helpful. So I get to help a lot of folks. Well, we're glad you're well. Um, you, let's get right to the nuts and bolts of your business. You took over United Airlines at a, at a difficult time. You, uh, had a, you had a very difficult merger underway with Continental Air Airlines. You're in the middle of major labor unrest. The former CEO was ousted in a bribery scandal. And you are right now in the middle of a major, really kind of a makeover for the airline, trying to improve customer service. And you and I talked a couple of weeks ago. This is at the core of what you are trying to accomplish right now. It sure is. Um, and if you, any of you were here yesterday, uh, Yo-Yo Ma was here, and I got to see him last night. And he and I connected philosophically a while back because he talks about culture and the changing of culture and his Bach project around the world and how the foundational basis for culture is trust. And I think the first thing, you know, what you just mentioned with uh, my predecessor and the company before, we had lost the hearts and minds of our own employees. And as all of you fly, you can absolutely tell me the same thing. It's like how our, my United family, our employees feel about themselves, about their company, uh, is a direct correlation to how they treat our customers. So my first big initiative is that we're going to regain the trust of our employees. And of course, we have many constituencies, and if you think of Wall Street, that one was didn't sit that well. It's like, you're going to do what? <laughs> and how does that compute? Well, it computes that we're a people-to-people -people business, and if we can't make you feel good about flying us, you're not going to fly us. And so uh, our first big initiative was to solve a lot of those issues. And, and since then, we've just been, it's a drumbeat almost every single couple of weeks of new innovations, digital product, uh, snacks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> always bring a prop. <laughs> Uh, but more importantly, a real heavy investment in our folks. We have all our flight attendants, 26,000 of them. Uh, we have them in Chicago for a couple of days in small, intimate groups of, you know, eight or 900. <laughs> Pause for applause, it says. Uh, the, but over the course of those two days, we just really interact with them in a, in a different and interesting, interesting way that's just uh, sort of... We want them to embody the spirit, the new spirit of United that's about caring for you, and it's difficult. We fly 160 million people, you know, and... 160 million people, people uh, around the world, to 65 different countries, and every interaction that you have with them is sort of a lot of times one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, but it's, I need, can I interject? Because I think the audience may be asking, yeah, but I remember the low point. Mm -hmm. And the low point was in 2017 when Dr. David Dow was dragged off a United flight, not by United personnel, by Chicago airport security personnel. He was severely injured, and uh, United was pillared for the next week or two because of its response to that. That, you've acknowledged, was a low point and a turning point for the airline. Absolutely, and uh, just to be clear, Pilloried was <laughs> this, <laughs> uh, and rightly so. Um, the fact and the facts behind that, while there was not a lot of United employees involved uh, specifically, uh, the fact 
is that it did happen on my watch and our watch, and so I stood up in Good Morning America and took, uh, I took the entire uh, situation upon myself, that we let our policies and procedures get in the way of doing the right thing. And it's been an absolute catalyst and accelerant for the things we were already doing, uh, because we have an even stronger sort of drive and emotion for you for you to feel better about our company, and more importantly for us, to never forget this question. Everybody always wants to, hey, is it okay if I ask this question? I said, bring it, absolutely. We, me, my 95,000 family members need to be constantly reminded of how quickly, how quickly something can go so awry and so wrong if we don't have the right procedures in place. So everything we've done since is about putting the customer at the center of everything that we do. The tools that we build, you know, the, the, the things we offer, it's all about every customer every flight, every day, which is a really, really tall task when you think of the amount of, of flights that we have on a, given, on a given daily basis. Biggest lesson from that incident? Uh, uh, from a social media perspective, uh, I think learning from me is the absolute velocity in which news travel. And it was at the time when we didn't have a social media function, per se, at our company. Uh, it wasn't that long ago. You might think us uh, as slow, but it's a big, giant company. And we, uh, we did not anticipate how fast and quickly this thing would scale, uh, and we had no response, and the initial response was, my response was awful. It was dealing with facts, right? I have facts in front of me that say, not us, and, but the world doesn't want to hear that. And so the, you know, the issue is understand the velocity of social media, uh, react to it in the, in the right way, and more importantly, put things in place, this is the key thing, that stuff like that doesn't happen again. And that's what we've done. So among the major headlines affecting your industry right this very minute, uh, it's the 737 MAX, which I've been involved in covering over the last year. We've had two fatal crashes, one in Indonesia, one in Ethiopia, 346 people dead. The plane's been grounded since March as Boeing tries to come up with a software fix. You, have, you were supposed to be flying 30 of those planes by now. Um, when do you expect that you will see that plane back in your fleet? when it is safe and secure to do so. And that's a very critical piece. It is, it is of paramount importance. There's a lot of things that have to happen and people have to get comfortable, and we need all of that to happen before we bring the aircraft back to safety. I promise to be on the first ever flight, commercial flight that we have at United. I think that Dave Dixon, who's the new head of the FAA, is gonna actually pilot the first flight. This, this plane will be safe, but us telling you that is not where we stop. You, as my customers anyway, will, will be have given full transparency when you're in one of those products, and if you decide to change, we are more than happy to rebook you in a different, uh, on a different aircraft at a different time. Passengers uh, can say, I'm sorry, I don't want to get on this plane. Yeah, uh, and we, hopefully we're going to let you know ahead of time so you don't get to the airport, and that's the only flight leaving, and you have to wait three or four hours, and so we've, we've got tools in that. But I think the important part of this, safety and security, I always say something called proof, not promise. The proof is we're going to let you know and you're going to have options to change if you need to because we're not going to suppose that just because we tell you it's safe or that I'm flying on it, uh, you know, I have to understand that there's going to be a lot of folks that are nervous and concerned, and you should be. That's your right to do so. Ninth Amendment, I think, wasn't written down exactly. <laughs> um, I watched your show a couple weeks ago. It was great. <laughs> um, you are not the FAA, and you're not, and you're not Boeing, but you are a huge customer for Boeing, and you work with the FAA every day. Did something go wrong with the FAA certification process in ever approving the 737 MAX for flight? You know, uh, the FAA and the air safety system in the United States has been in place for 90 years, and we've always been the preeminent organization with regards to data and facts that support the safety and qualifications of aircraft. And, and it's been that place for so long. We, unfortunately, not always can in today's world, but we need to trust in organizations that have been doing this for a long time. And so one of the things that we know in the world of safety is that facts and data count. And so the facts and data that have been presented on, on all matters have been, uh, have been pointing in the right direction for so long. So, you know, where FAA stands with the government, with people. So that's something they'll have to work through. But from our perspective, they are the body of work and the people that do this and have done this for a long time. So we do, in effect, trust them. Last follow-up on the MAX. And we'll wait for the proper time to bring this aircraft back. Okay. Last follow-up on the MAX. If the FAA hasn't certified the MAX by Christmas time, or if you simply aren't ready to introduce the plane by Christmas time, 
Will that impact your flight schedules? Of course. Um, by the end of the year, there's probably 100 flights per day that would have been flying had we had the aircraft. And so without it, obviously, we won't fly those. And so it has that impact. But again, this is not a commercial conversation. It really isn't. We'd like to get the product back to get you where you want to go, safely, obviously. Uh, but uh, we'll bring that aircraft back when everyone says it's OK to do so. Uh, the CEO of United Airlines, how often do you fly in coach? <laughs> do, you, do you know what we deal with on a regular basis? I'll tell you. Uh, it's, uh... <laughs> I, I do it more often than people would think. Um, I only fly. Uh, you have to eat what you cook, so to speak, to your, your question. The things, and I could tell you stories for hours about the things, why it's so important to actually fly coach, be on your own aircraft, constantly in the back rooms, because you get to see and feel and, and, and think like other folks. And Do you wear a brown bag over your hat? You know, it's, it's funny. Um, I, I've become, uh, we have these safety videos, and I'm on them, so. Um, yeah. So what do you learn when you fly coach? What do you learn as opposed to everybody wants to fly business or first, if you could? What do you learn as the CEO when you fly coach? Listen, it reinforced our latest sort of messaging about every customer, every flight, every day. It's not just about the front class. And it's not about egalitarianism, it's about offering choice to a different group of people and their, their budgetary needs, but more importantly, this every customer, every flight. When you sit in the back, there is a different experience, there's no question. So there's several announcements coming that my people always get concerned if I, I voice them too quickly, but you're gonna see this drumbeat of, of, of product rollout that enhances the experience for everybody on the aircraft, not just the first cabin. We love our front cabin, uh, don't get me wrong, for all of you that fly air, but at the same time, it's important that we offer a service and that everyone on that aircraft feels good because here's an interesting uh, uh, sort of tidbit. About 70 to 80% of people, on average, on any given aircraft, will be their only time flying that year. So the way we think about it is that I only have one chance to make an impression on someone that flies infrequently, and I want to make the best impression possible. Yeah, I find that stat amazing. If you didn't catch it, 70 to 80 percent of the customers fly one time a year. That's astonishing. But can you um, also help me out with a, a quick follow-up? You're talking about enhancing the customer experience. You just, in the last few days, announced a major change to your Mileage Plus program. Can you give us the top three bullet points? Because I've read the fine print, and it goes on forever. <laughs> I think the simple answer is simple. Uh, when you earn your miles, you get to keep them forever, in case you want. <laughs> Second, when we give you upgrades, we want to give you the opportunity to, you know, actually use them. Um, I know, this is, this is brilliant <laughs> stuff, I'm telling you. It's just, <laughs> But you know, it's an interesting, because this is, when you, when you put the customer at the center of things that you do, it's the customer filter. It's like, okay, from our administrative perspective, the, the whole uh, frequent flyer mileage is a very difficult program to manage, but it's not about that. It's about you earning and using, and so we want to make that a lot easier. Uh, and the third thing is it, it's an electronic thing. You don't have to call. You can put it in for multiple flights, and if something doesn't work, you don't get, your, you don't get the, the mileage taken away. So ease of use, right? It's currency that you can use interchangeably digitally and retract it if it doesn't need, and it's just, it's a, just a better, simpler, customer-oriented product than our complexity that we had before. And that's all in the, the, the small print down there somewhere. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, few CEOs, few industries touch the global economy like an airline does. Uh, and you have firsthand, real, uh, tangible experience with China, with Hong Kong, with Asia, with, with, with Europe and, and the UK. Can we talk through two of those? Uh, what impact are you seeing, if anything, on because of Brexit. I know that airfares into London are already down 20% or so, system-wide, not just United, because of Brexit. What impact is Brexit going to have on the global economy and on the airlines? Well, a hard exit um, is a very daunting proposition for the world. I mean, it's the, the economic ripples of that are gonna be felt. Uh, people in Europe in particular will be affected. Current UK residents or UK citizens working in the EU, all of, it's, it's a very uh, complicated situation and difficult. Uh, from our perspective, we're not seeing the weakness to our London market. It's a, well, we I think have 16 flights a day there from various ports in the, points in the US. So we haven't seen the drop uh, in that regard. And, but 
uh, a hard exit is going to cause some ripples. We don't know what those are, and we have contingency plans around that if needed, but uh, that's a difficult. The pound is weakening, so British uh, tourists are not traveling abroad as much as they did just a year or two ago. If that continues, that could impact your Yeah, no, we've, we've clearly seen. So markets from U.S. to the, to the, to the Europe are fine. It's the return yeah. flights that are just a little softer. But again, this is a business where, go around the world, you know, Argentina is a mess, but Brazil and Mexico are doing well. China and Hong Kong specifically are a mess, but greater Asia is hanging in there. And so we have this wide portfolio that we always manage and work, and we're able to be flexible and, and adjust our schedules and such to make sure that, uh, that we take care of our customers, but also don't go broke in the process, which for all of us that have been around for a while, people yeah. don't, we have to be a bit capitalist in the sense that we need to stay above ground, and it's a very expensive business. Are, are the boom and bust cycles over? You brought it up, and you're right. It used to be that the airlines would have a great year, and then it was a bad few years, then a great year. Are we over that? I don't think so. I think the economy is going to you know, the economy is going to do what it's always historically done for all the different macro factors. The trick to an organization and industry like ours is that okay, that's what happens. So how do you flex up and down? And I think one of the things, and if, you, if we talk about financial markets, that this industry has always been hampered with is low multiples because of that volatility and boom and cycle uh, and boom and bust cycle. While well, we're proving it, we had huge fuel increases a year ago that we were able to recover and work through. And then this year has been a smattering. Government shutdown, Pakistani airspace, the max grounding, storms, yeah. I mean, it's just gone. The latest fuel with Saudi Arabia. That's a good example, actually. Historically, that would have really impacted the industry. But fuel, you know, our stock went down in the first day and then came right back up. Yeah. So a little resiliency in our industry uh, is good. And it's good for you because we get to invest in wonderful things <laughs> like this. <laughs> All right, so we've got less than a minute, and I do want to ask this question. Um, for, those, uh, for those of us who, who love aviation and who follow it, give us a sense of what's going to be the biggest change in our experience, not in the next six months, but in the next five or 10 years. What's going to dramatically change? Richard Branson is talking about a suborbital orbital trip that will take you from New York to Japan. What is your sense of what's going to be the biggest change on the horizon? Well. So technologically speaking, there's going to be some hypersonic flight uh, that's already been tested. Uh, kind of the uh, the the product inside, uh, it, it just a host of you know more fuel efficient aircraft, fast. All, all of those things will happen. Interiors will get better. Entertainment will, will all get better. Uh, the way you book your flights, all of that uh, it continues to be on a march towards that. But and that's important. The real important part is we can never, and I mean we can never ever 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 forget that every one of you is being connected for a special reason and purpose that's special to you. And so all the frills, all the, all the it's, it's all part and parcel, but we've got to, as, an, as a human to another human basis, maintain that sort of positive uh, and ener energy with regards to you know, how you feel about that flight, how we make you feel. And so the combination of product with the persona, the connection, the charisma. If when you fly us, you'll see, and you probably are seeing an increasing amount of interaction. Where we really, 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 really do love having you on board. I mean, we we want to make sure, as opposed to, you know, get in your seat. We will not. <laughs> but we will. But it, but listen. So safety and security are paramount, and which is why we do a lot of things. When we ask you to put your seatbelt on, it isn't a question, right? <laughs> We're not, gonna, we're not gonna abdicate safety. Turbulence is a real big thing. People get really hard. So we are gonna be insistent, nicely, with a smile, to put the damn seatbelt on, yes. <laughs> and that's important for you to know that we're trying to do so. Oscar Munoz, thank you very much. You did a great job, nice to do. For a session produced by our underwriter, please welcome Karen Dayhut, Executive Vice President, Global Defense Group, Booz Allen Hamilton, here with Fox News National Security Correspondent, Jennifer Griffin. Oh, Good morning. Thank you. Hello. It's great to be Hello. here. Well, I'm so happy to be here and um, grateful that you're joining me and Karen to talk about her role at Booz Allen. She's been at Booz Allen for 17 years. She is the executive vice president for Global Defense Group, basically making her the number two at Booz Allen. And Karen, you and I both know that the number of women in the workforce in tech and defense and consulting is not what it should be. Yes. So 
everyone wants to know, how did you get to the C-suite? Well, that's a big question, and I'll start at the beginning, which is maybe the best place to start. My first job, like so many Americans, was working at McDonald's. <laughs> and to be honest with you, my first job was also my first job failure. I don't even think we talked about this, Jen, but um, I had the opportunity as a very young 15-year-old to work at McDonald's in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It was the first McDonald's that had drive through oh. And uh, they put me in drive through one day, and I backed up onto the major highway 17 cars, <laughs> trying to deliver burgers and fries to these uh, very hungry people. I didn't go back on to drive through duty for many months. So that was my first job, but also I learned a lot around customer service mm -hmm. and resiliency and all of those things that are so important today. And what about the Navy? You were in the Navy as a young woman. Yes. What did that teach you and how is that part of this journey? Well, I am so proud to be a veteran. Um, my father served for 42 years in the United States Navy and so in a lot of ways I followed in his footsteps. And my only seven or eight years in the Navy were one of the most um, hallmark moments of my professional life. It was not without its challenges. Um, I, as a very young officer, an ensign and then a JG, was asked to take on a technology department at Camp Lejeune. It's a Marine Corps base. So it's a Marine Corps base. Make of, make of that what you want. <laughs> but, um, and I arrived as a 22-year-old. And uh, the lead civilian at the time was a former command master sergeant in the Marines. And he was old and crusty and had a very strong opinion of himself and where the department should go. And uh, he really didn't like taking orders from a 22-year-old woman. Um, and he really made my life quite difficult and really challenging. But over the course of the first couple of months, I decided I needed to, to take action. I needed to do something if I was going to really lead and drive a vision for this organization, I needed to make something happen with him. And so I went to HR and law, the lawyers and everything to get advice. Their advice to me, much of like what a lot of young women get today, is, you know what, it's okay, just relax. You don't have to do anything, don't take drastic action. But in my gut, I knew that I wanted to do something, and in order to be able to do something, I was going to have to do something about him. He used to arrive at the office at 5 o'clock in the morning uh, and was there long before I arrived. So one morning, I decided I would get there long before him. I got there at about a quarter of five, and I sat in his office, and I waited for him. And I gave him a piece of my mind. I delivered a very strongly worded letter to him. And fast forward, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. We still exchange Christmas cards today. He's still old and crusty <laughs> and living in North Carolina. but. Yeah. And Somebody that's a lesson that, you took to Booz Allen very as a much so. How have you changed the culture for women at Booz Allen? Well, there are so many of us that can take credit, including our CEO, who is a huge champion of women and diversity and inclusion, he himself being an immigrant. Um, I think what we've done is really champion the idea of like me in the C-suite. So, we want people at Booz Allen to look up in our organization and see people that look like them, whether they are gender diversity or ethnic diversity, whether lesbian, gay, bi, whatever it is, we want people to be able to see themselves in that community. And so when I first started as a partner at Booz Allen, um, that wasn't the case of the women. But now, if you look up in the women, um, we have 42% of our board of directors are women. Greater than 50%, thank you, <laughs> yes! Greater than 50% of our firm's leadership are women. And let me be clear on this point. Three of the four line leadership roles at Booz Allen are held by women, running large markets and big businesses. It speaks volumes about who we are as an institution. But it wasn't like that yeah, when you arrived. Not. There weren't no. women with children. You have no. two children. That's was, right. Was there ever a moment that you wanted to give up, and how did you carry oh on? Oh, my goodness, many times. I mean, when I was first pregnant with my oldest daughter, who's now 25, um, I was ready to just take an off-ramp. Yep. You know, I just couldn't see how I could 
be a great mom and do all of the things I wanted to do as a mother and lead a big business and do well at work. My very good friend, a lawyer, and I call her my consigliere, said, Karen, what are you thinking? You can do this. And so relying on that women's network is so important. And taking care of family. Yes. How, did, how do you create a team where it's okay to say that you have to take care of a child or an a ailing parent? You've been in that situation. Yes. Well, we have cancer in our background similarly, and it uh, you know, uh, can be devastating. My mom was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, subsequently passed from that disease. But when I was um, brand new uh, in the executive ranks at Booz Allen, she was diagnosed. And I was in Pittsburgh, which is where her family and where she was being treated initially. And um, it was devastating as a, as, a, as a mom myself to see my mother going through this and um, how would I cope with that and deal with that. In fact, one of the uh, funniest stories about that time is we were traveling back from Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> she was in my car. I was taking her to a new hospital, the NIH, in Bethesda. And I get a call from my youngest daughter's school that my daughter has lice. <laughs> I'm in the car with my mom, who has cancer, who is having a, a clot, a blood clot, and I have to deal with lice in my eight-year-old. And so I call my women's network. What else do you do? I called all my girlfriends. They came out and sort of took care of her and, and made sure she yeah. got shampooed and got out of school, et cetera. <laughs> this, I think this idea of juggling. Is she good now? She's good now. All right, good. Yeah. All right. And tell me about the Wonder Women Project. Uh, yes, Allen's we're very proud of that. We are uh, partnered with the Center for Talent Innovation, looking at what does it really take to accelerate development, advance women at an accelerated pace. And we've done a lot of research with CTI, and not surprisingly, Jen, what we have found is that really scaled, sustainable programs matter. And so this idea of gender pay, it matters to women, yes. right? You know, equal pay for genders. Um, also, strong mentorship programs really matter. And so making sure that you're building those kind of programs across your institution. But there's certain kind of mentors that you said are toxic. Yes. What are yes. they? So, I think uh, women have to be really courageous in seeking out the right mentors. I think women can often get mentors that are ruinously empathetic to them. And what I mean by that is they allow them to be okay with the struggle, with not putting their best foot forward. It's okay, Jen, that you have three children at home. And I know you can't take on this project pity. right now. Yeah, pity. Pity yes. and empathetic, but it's ruinous to a woman's career. And so for me, I sought out mentors that would give me a little kick in the behind when I needed it, and that was really helpful to me. And lastly, get out of jail free cards. What take are risks. they? Why do, why do you, what have you done with this? You have to take risks. Um, I love this notion that we need to teach our girls to be brave and courageous and not perfect, and so we as women have to take risks. We have to be willing to put ourselves out there in our careers in ways that may feel very, very uncomfortable, but that risk-taking really helps to accelerate your career. And so you provide, what are these get out of jail freed cards? So I gave workforce? these cards out um, to my leadership team at the time, and it was really a way of encouraging them to take risks. Yeah. And I said, look, here's a laminated get out of jail card just like in Monopoly, and if you do something really stupid and it fails and you get in trouble for it, bring that to me and you will get out of jail free. <laughs> so, <laughs> on that note, I want to thank, thank you our so guest, much. Karen Davis. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Jen. All thank right. You. Thank you so Great. much. Thanks. And now for a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Get Up and Stretch break, please welcome Coach Mo from Emerging Scholars Academy in Arlington, Virginia. Thank you, I remember you guys. It's time to get up, stretch up. All right, I wanna make sure everybody's got a chance, put your phones away. We don't have a lot of time today. All right, this one is gonna be a nice and easy stretch. Just reach up to the sky, get up on your toes. Take it out wide, go down. Reach up to the sky, take it up on your toes, stretch out wide, and go down. 
And this one is gonna be hard one. We're gonna go the reverse, reach up from your knees. Deep breath and hold. Let it go. This one you get to scream, reach up from your knees. Take a deep breath, let it out. Oh. All right, last one and I wanna hear your voice, reach up. Deep breath, let me hear it. Let it out with the sound. Oh. Very well done, see you guys again. Discussing a new kind of leadership, please welcome Dia Sims, the president of Combs Enterprises, here with the host of WNYC's All of It and an Atlantic contributor, Allison Stewart. Hi, Hi everybody. Thanks for being with us. Nice to see you, Dia. Oh, good to see you. So to give a sense of what's in Dia's portfolio, Combs Enterprises includes the brands Bad Boy Entertainment, the clothing lines Sean John and Zach Posen, Ciroc Vodka, De Leon Tequila, the Blue Flame Ad Agency, Bad Boy Touring, Revolt Films, Revolt Media and TV, and the Combs Foundation. If you go, that's the portfolio. That's the end of our panel. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go to the, the website and you look at the C-suite, it's all people of color, half women. Sean Combs has also founded a charter school as part of the foundation. Yes. And in 2017, Forbes put his estimated wealth at 820 million. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Dia's rise, how she started there as an assistant, a little bit about how they've been able to cultivate a culture, a culture that looks towards the future. And that was gonna be the end of the discussion, but then last night, a little news broke, there was a leak. Dia has a brand new project she's gonna be working on. She's going to be leaving Combs Enterprises with Sean's blessing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Not, you had a big release plan last week. <laughs> Pesky reporters got the story. <laughs> so Dia, what had been your original plan? You're a little girl. Oh, golly. Hmm, well, that was a long time ago. And uh, honestly, this sounds extremely like Pollyannish, and, and, but I did very much grow up in a, you know, do what you love, right? My dad was um, a police sergeant. My mother worked in a variety of jobs until she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, and this was like a woman who would get up every morning, run three miles, come make breakfast, take us home. And she started to becoming, um, you know, when her movement began to deteriorate, it was pretty significant for her. Um, mm -hmm. So she stayed at home, which, although obviously the disease was hard to watch, um, I know for a fact that I was able to benefit by her being home and being able to spend so much time with her um, on a regular basis. One of the things that was interesting, I think, for me growing up and didn't realize it at the time was I grew up in a neighborhood uh, called East Elmhurst in Queens, New York, right near LaGuardia Airport and also Rikers Island. Uh, <laughs> that's for another day. Um, and in that area, there was this burgeoning of hip hop. So if you're familiar with Salt and Pepper and Kid and Play, um, a gentleman by the name of Herbie Lovebug, a bit of a precursor to Puff Daddy, Brother Love, Diddy, whatever you know him by. Um, so literally I would be like a kid and in my backyard I would see like Salt and Pepper practicing their dance moves over and over and over again. And um, you know, I, Kid and Play having block parties or them shooting videos for Kwame and the famous polka dotted move, anybody remembers that movement. Um, and what was interesting to witness was this like cool cultural hobby all of a sudden turn into a like a significant industry. So a few years later, there's a full feature film and movies across the United States called House Party, right? I start to see them opening up barbershops locally. Like now they're actually writing checks to the local schools. And obviously from nine to 13, I don't think I consciously realized it, but I don't think it was a coincidence that I ended up then working mm -hmm. for you know, Puff Daddy for 14 years later and saying like, hey, wait a minute, this hip hop is bigger than music. This is an entire culture that's now a trillion dollar global industry. That's right now the number one on streamed music source um, on Spotify and um, thinking through like what are the how do we actually build our culture economically how do we start to build real legacy wealth through this platform you have a really interesting way you got there though you worked for the Department of Defense oh, yeah. you worked for a pharmaceutical giant yes. you worked in club promotion and so now you're president of a multi-tiered entertainment company what do those all have in common hmm well um, I think very much on target with what we're talking about today. I often get asked a question about like, oh, hip hop, it's 
so misogynistic. Like, what's it like? Like, it's kind of like when I work at the Department of Defense. <laughs> 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 uh, like, the, the truth of the matter is, uh, there is no industry at the C-suite level that has a firm hold on the lack of diversity, right? It is a widespread problem and it requires a widespread solution. Um, I worked in so many different industries. Um, DOD, not too far from where we are today. I, you know, through parties in my 20s, not too far from where we are <laughs> today. Um, and uh, I talk a lot about being a 22-year-old kind of young woman in either a room with uh, generals and men who had been working for Boeing for 50 years and confused about like what would I contribute in that room, or whether I was throwing a party down the block and had to make it clear that I was there for work and not interested in being you know smacked on the butt on my way to you know <laughs> to order to order drinks for everyone. And I started this kind of mental thing which I call now like the clipboard effect, um, which I don't think anybody has clipboards anymore. But at the time, myself and the women that I work with, I would literally like in the beginning of the day like I would go to Staples, buy a bunch of them, and hand out physical clipboards. Because if you had a clipboard in your hand, you were treated differently. The you gentlemen in the club, they would not, you know, they would say, oh, excuse me, which way or how can I get it? It was a very, if you put it down, it was a very different interaction. So for me, um, particularly as I started to become in heavier and heavier rooms, I would mentally think through, like, what is the way, what is the gravitas in the way I enter a room? What is the level of information I'm going to bring to the table that's kind of this, I don't know, metaphorical clipboard effect? How did you first meet Sean Combs, PW? So the way I received this, so, so actually, um, uh, I grew up in the mid-90s, so I don't even know if he knows this, but I was definitely, we definitely were in some of the same circles in, in, at that time period, but the way this job came to be was I worked in radio, another, another job, um, <laughs> and, and advertising sales, and I inherited um, the music labels in New York City at this like upstart hip-hop station for Clear Channel. Um, and one of the executives who worked with him reached out to me and was like, He's, Sean is looking to hire a new chief of staff. Would you be interested in applying for the job? I had no relevant experience. Um, and I even asked her, I was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm always down for an interview, but like, tell me you know, what, were you, what, what you're thinking about this. She really was like, you send emails at like 3 a.m., so I feel like you guys have a lot in common because he does not <laughs> sleep. <laughs> um, so took the interview, interview was maybe five or six minutes. He has like a terrific poker face. Um, I usually think I know, like, oh, I nailed it. I walked out, I was like, mm, I don't know. Um, they called and said, look, he would like to hire you, but you don't have a lot of experience in managing large teams, so would you be willing to come on as the executive assistant? Um, and I never really have been concerned about titles. I'm more concerned about, is there a place, is this a place I can learn? I was very much like, you can call me the janitor. This is what I want to make financially, and I want to have an opportunity to mm -hmm. grow. And they were like, okay, come on over. A lot of people do get hung up in titles. Yeah. Why didn't you? You know, I feel, um, I've always felt really good about the idea that you can, you know, you can, you can be the master, right, of, of what your path looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing is getting in the door, right? And for me, I had, as, as you said, I worked in a variety of fields, but having looked at like Sean Combs' trajectory and path, I was like, this is a guy I can really learn from. And I'm a super geek, and it's most important to me to be like, can I be learning something every second, every minute of the day? So I didn't really care what I was called. I was like, I want to go to a place where I can learn. It doesn't work out, I'll go do the next thing. It's interesting, you ha I like your DIA rules about the clipboard. The other one was when you first got there, you didn't put anything personal up. Yeah. Why did you not want to have anything personal? And, and let me first say, I actually don't recommend that. And I'm very impressed and excited about like, the movement now where I feel like women are like, no, I'm coming to bring my whole self to work, and it is what it is. Um, I started at Combs Enterprises the week after I turned 30. And I'm now, and I turned 44 tomorrow. I and uh, <laughs> and um, I was very super conscious about the fact that this was an industry where, yeah, this was a lot of celebrity. There was sometimes confusion about um, how women should be treated. So I was very intentional. I had not one personal effect on my desk. I was always really civil and pleasant. But as you can imagine, in this industry, there's tons of parties. But I would literally go into work like, oh, this is so fun. Excuse me, excuse me. Hey, Puff, I'm going to need you to sign off on this. Yep, oh, you have a question about that? We're up 6%. I'm back if you need me. I'm back at the office. Um, and I think it just set 
the appropriate tone for the way I expected to be treated, but also just real clarity around why I belonged in that room. The nature of working with somebody like Sean is I needed to be equally as impactful, and these are like real scenarios, with the royal family in London as I would be in a studio in East New York and Brooklyn and making sure that these 15 rappers were on time for their studio session. Um, so that requires an ability to you know, be myself everywhere I went, but ensure that as soon as you come in, you know I mean business. I know you mean business, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I talked a little bit about at the top what your, what your C-suite looks like, and at Revolt Media, it's 67% people of color, 50% yes. of the women at the CVP level, at the senior vice president level, are women. Um, yeah, it's really something to be proud of. What advice would you give a legacy company where that, something like that seems almost impossible? Or someone might tell you it's impossible, let me put it that way. Yeah, I mean, the reality is all things are possible if you're willing to put the commensurate resources into it. Um, is it enormously challenging? There's no question of that. I'm sure we've all seen um, the research that shows basically after 150 people, right, the, you start to lose so much efficiency in a company. Although, if you're like the federal government who has two million employees, it'd be difficult to have a bunch of sub-factions of 150 people. This is something that you can think about in the way you approach diversity. Um, if you're at an organization where you need to be dedicated to it at the global level, don't get me wrong, but are there opportunities to say, how do I hyper-focus on these sub-segments so that I know I'm doing it right? Mm -hmm. what, you know what I mean? How do I go into this particular, into my tech group, and figure out how I'm really disciplined about ensuring that we have blind interviews, that we actually use AI for the initial screening so that individual bias doesn't creep into it. That we pay attention to the effect that when you have only one minority or one woman in the final hiring, well, actually the, the correct stat is actually if you have one minority in the final hiring group, right, it's statistically zero percent that that person gets hired. If you have two or more for minorities, it goes up to 194 times more likely. For women, it goes up to 74 times more likely. So it's easy to say, let's have at least two minorities in the recruitment pool. That data bears that out. That's an easy thing that you can actually put into practice. Um, I would also say the reality is, Although workplace diversity is a huge and gaping issue in America, it is a reflection of a much larger issue. So it's hard to be diverse at work if you're not diverse at home. It's just, it's just <laughs> the truth. Um, and we all tend to self-segregate in whatever group you're in. Um, so it's important to be intentional about creating and developing legitimate relationships across serious lines of difference. Not like a Pisces and a Libra, right? Like serious <laughs> lines of difference um, because it's difficult. I've, had, I've, I've been grateful that I've been able to have relationships with you know, C-suite of huge multinational organizations building that, that can pull me aside and say, like, we want to do better, but we don't know anybody else like you. And that now, I, I know people who will be offended by that and say, that's a ridiculous statement, but I'm happy to have an open, clear conversation. I'll be like, I got you. What do you need? You need more? I know, I know thousands of brilliant, but I'm not a unicorn. There's a million people like me, and mm -hmm. if you don't know them, let me be the bridge. It's interesting. I, people talk about the pipeline. <laughs> when you talk to people about diversity issues, a lot of times they'll say, but the pipeline, but the pipeline. But there can be more than one pipeline. I mean, it doesn't have to just be everybody coming out of Wharton and Tuck. I mean, you got, I think about HBCUs and Greek organizations. There's all kinds of places to recruit. Yeah, I think the pipeline is a little bit of a misnomer, but I, because to your point, there are historically black colleges and universities. There are the what's called the Divine Nine. If you go to the black fraternities, right? That's particularly for 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 African Americans. But these type of things exist in every diverse segment. Theory, you know, again, I think you're dealing with a bigger issue, though, that there are sometimes pipeline issues, and not to, you know, this may be a little bit of a heavy topic, but I think we need to be able to deal with these kind of things in real life. We live in a country, actually, you know, when you look at history, one of the only countries where in times of slavery, the amount of anti-literacy laws was a real thing. Mostly everywhere else in the world, if you were in a slave population, you could still read, right? So here, up for about, from the 1400s mm -hmm. to the late 1800s, you would you were not allowed to read by law. You would be potentially, you know what I mean? That's a big deal. So there are legitimate like, things mm -hmm. that, this, that, this com that this country has to kind of deal with to overcome and say like, well, maybe um, tech is not being taught at, at, at the early ages, or maybe there is a real dearth. And that's the case, what are we doing collectively to account for that, to make sure that the companies are truly diverse, which is actually just good for business. 
It's actually just good for profits. Um, so it's worth, I think, the short-term appropriate level of investment for the long-term ROI, both financially, and it's also just the right thing to do for the moral fabric of the country. Let's talk about your new business for a moment. Because this is an opportunity to start a business the way you want to, and you're going into the CBD business. Yes, so, 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 so I often talk about um, industries and real innovation, sometimes have to start from scratch, right? So we often mistake improvement for innovation. Um, and that if you want to really build something in the right way, sometimes you just have to actually build it from scratch. Like iPhones didn't come from Palm Pilots, Netflix didn't come from Blockbuster, right? A lot of times like really crazy, even the automotive industry mm -hmm. didn't come from horses, right? <laughs> so it starts a lot of times um, from scratch. Even though we're relatively far in, in the, the cannabis and in, in the US and the um, hemp derived CBD business, we're already seeing that in the United States, less than 5% of um, dollars being made in the industry are going back into diverse communities. There are literally no women um, in most of the meetings that I've been in um, in the past few years. And I felt like, you know what, this is at least a young enough industry that we could get in and make a change right now. Um, I mentioned that my dad was a police sergeant in New York. And when he, where he grew up, uh, it was well known, like the police would go after minorities. He actually grew up in a very like anti-police environment. But he taught my family that if you want to make a change, you have to become a part of the system. It's much easier actually to change it often from within. So he started the first uh, group under the Internal Affairs, this is like in the 80s, to train officers on um, civility and discourse in black and Hispanic uh, in, uh, neighborhoods in a very different way, but kind of with the same approach. It's kind of how I'm viewing the cannabis industry right now in North America. Um, there's an exciting opportunity, um, an amazing opportunity in like a millennium where we can actually change the future of American business, right? So if you think about um, what the gold rush did in terms of the railroad industry and the development of the West and how we still benefit from this day from what happened then, we're living in a time like that right now. For me, I couldn't sit on the sidelines and not like jump in. Um, but I'm equally excited about the commercial opportunity as I am about, okay, this is an opportunity where like what we did at Combs, we can be really prescriptive about ensuring that there is appropriate levels of diversity in, uh, you know, in religious identity and gender identity and, um, you know, and proper diversity and build it from scratch. And, I did, you know, I've been talking to Sean about this for a year and got his blessing uh, <laughs> to move forward and hopefully we'll be doing something cool together. Um, and we're, we're, we're excited about what's to come in that space. And what's the name of the company going to be? Burn. Burn Group, BRN, BRN, <laughs> Burn Group. And, when, <laughs> and when's your big official announcement so people can look for um, it? It will be uh, the first week of October. All right. Yes. Well, we wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, Dan. <laughs> Next, a session produced by our underwriter, Bear. What you just saw on the screen is actually the future of farming. My name is Mark Young. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of a company called the Climate Corporation, which is the digital farming division within Bayer Crop Science. And I'm joined here on the stage today by Mr. Kamal Bell, a teacher, a farmer, a youth advocate, and founder of the Sankofa Agricultural Academy, as well as a couple of his students, Mr. Cameron Jackson, uh, whose bees you just saw on the screen earlier, and Mr. Kamani King, who is a great prototype for what the future of farming really looks like. There's two things about my job that are my absolute favorite. The first is I get to travel all over the world and talk to farmers of all different backgrounds and all different capabilities. And the second favorite part is I get to meet the younger generation, get them excited about a career in STEM and a career in agriculture. And I'm inviting you all to join me to do a little bit of both up here today. Kamal, can you tell us a little bit about Sankofa Farms? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mark. I was an agricultural teacher in Durham, North Carolina for four years, and one of the things that I noticed was that the school system didn't give a lot of opportunity to the young black males. So at Sankofa Farms, we developed an agricultural academy that would expose this, this demographic and these young men to the possibilities of change that exist within the field of agriculture. 
So we've grown from four students now to seven, and this year we actually harvested produce and we had honey as well. So they're really growing with the farm. So as we built this sustainable and self-sufficient operation, we have received help from Bear Crop Science in developing our beekeeping operation. And now this really represents an interesting dynamic because you have this global entity that has like a mass amount of resources working with a small 12 acre farm in Durham, North Carolina. So today, everyone's gonna hear from two of our trailblazers, two young men who are paving the way, and not only are they embodying the true mission of what Sankofa truly means, they're also changing the perspective of what agriculture looks like within the black community. That's awesome, and it's absolutely our pleasure at Bayer Crop Science to, to sponsor the work that you guys are doing at Sankofa. The thing I think is really interesting about Sankofa is it accomplishes two of the things that we know are key uh, to the success of agriculture. One is getting our community closer to what happens on the farm. Um, we've, we've really grown apart from what happens on the, on the farm. Not many of us are involved in farming, and, and a lot of us don't know today where our food comes from. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is engaging the next generation to get them excited about what happens in agriculture. They're absolutely the, the future. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 16, I was working at Kmart. Um, but uh, Mr. Cameron Jackson here, he's 16, and he is a certified beekeeper, and those were his bees that you just saw. So Cameron, can you tell us a little bit about how, how this all came about? Well, uh, I first got involved with bees one day when we was at the farm. Mr. Bell jokingly asked us all, do we want bees on the farm? Everyone dismissed it like it wasn't a discussion to be had, but I was the one to say, why not have bees? Our first, like when he was going over the terms, he told me that if I didn't take care of the bees because I got stung and I didn't like them anymore, I would still have to take care of them and I would have to, you know, feed them. <laughs> I agreed to his terms and our first encounter with the bees, we didn't have any of the proper equipment to effectively go into the hives. So I actually got stung on my elbow, and at that point, I, was, I don't want these things. <laughs> so, and, but as time progressed, I started to come attached to the bees in some sense. Because once you get to see them start something from nothing, you get to see the intricate things that they can actually do in the hive by themselves without any maintenance from humans, it's pretty amazing. That's great. I think that's an important tip for our audience who might want to take care of bees, that if you want to take care of bees, the suit is an important piece of equipment. Uh, we've got a picture of your hive up there on the screen. What can you tell us about that? Well, first thing, I'm going to, I'm going to start with a question. Uh, can you find the queen bee? And the reason for this question is because it's one of the first things that we check for in a healthy colony checklist. That's, that's great. Uh, Kamal, can you tell us a little bit more about, about this colony checklist? Yeah, so the, the healthy colony checklist is a, an arrangement of six steps, and there are six things that you're trying to look for every time you go into your beehive. So Cameron asked you, could you find the queen? That's because the queen is the essential component of the hive, and once you find her and have all these other steps checked off, you know that you have a healthy colony. That's great. So, so we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. today having this conversation, and you're using this as a checklist to check on your bees back in North Carolina. Yeah, so once we hit the plane and get back in North Carolina, we're going to put our bee suits on and get our bees ready for this winter. Yeah, again, the suit's a very important part of that. Uh, th thanks, thanks for that. Now, there's a lot of technology uh, that has been devoted in the last couple of years, especially into pollinators and bee health, and, and, and there's startups that monitor the, the state of beehives. But the other piece of, of the future of ag is what does the future of, of, of the farmer look like? And that's what I think Kamani is a great example of, of what that might look like. Kamani, can you tell us a little bit about how you first got uh, involved in Sankofa Farms? Like Cameron, I got involved with Sankofa Farms in seventh grade where Mr. Bell would come and get us from my classes at Lowe's Grove Middle School and he would take us to the courtyard and we would work with the uh, various projects and one of the projects that stuck with me was uh, being able to hatch baby chickens in the incubator over a 21 day process. That is really neat. So my understanding is you were involved with Sankofa Farms right from the early beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about what the farm looked like at the very beginning? It was a beautiful disaster. <laughs> <laughs> because at the, at the state, the this, uh, beginning of the farming, I pictured a, a big open land of farming, of a farm, and when I, when I got there, it was the complete opposite. It was just a lot of waste, tree stumps, and weeds, and we had to, we had to literally work 
and clear the land so we can be able to grow crops and have our bees on the farm. And, and so what does it look like now? It, it looks like an ideal farm when you, when you look on the television and you see a farm, it, it's starting to look like that now. <laughs> that's, that's good, that's good. So this is amazing to me and what you do at Sankofa Farm. So, so tell, me, tell us all a little bit, how has this experience, getting to experience the, the, what happens on Sankofa Farms, how has that changed you in your perspective? It changed me in having a, a, a better output on my future and what, what, what I like to solve in the future with uh, staying connected with farming and getting fellow peers of my kind involved with farming. That's, that's really good. So, yeah, that absolutely deserves some applause. And, it's not just about perspective. How do you think this has changed your future outlook? What do you think the future holds for you? I think the future holds us getting, getting more people involved with the farm and being able to break generational poverty in the African American community. Yeah. So Kamal, you've got to be super proud of these guys up here. You know, what else, what else can you, what do you want to add? I there? told myself I wasn't going to cry, but <laughs> just like what they're working on is so much bigger than farming, it's bigger than Sankofa. They're really on to something really special, and we just appreciate that Bear has partnered to help us in this, in this process. Yeah. Really appreciate it. I, want to, I seriously want to thank you guys for coming up here and sharing your story with all of us today. Um, we at Bayer Crop Science are absolutely privileged uh, to, to do this kind of thing and sponsor, uh, you know, operations like, like yours. It is critical that we, we get, we increase the level of education uh, about agriculture and where our food comes from, um, that we lean into innovation to solve some of the, uh, the aspects, uh, uh, the challenging aspects that are facing us today in, in agriculture, and just absolutely critical to get uh, the next generation of, of, of folks interested in, in technology and agriculture and, and, and onto the farm because they absolutely are going to be the, the future of how we, uh, we solve these things. You know, the stakes are incredibly high. Um, there's going to be another 2 billion people uh, on this planet in the next 30-ish years that we're going to have to figure out how to feed, and it is going to take change and is gonna take innovation. And we know that one of the things that, that drives that is an absolute uh, diversity of perspective, of background, et cetera, to get as, mu as much uh, of that opportunity uh, you know, converted into, into action uh, as, as we possibly can. So it's, uh, it's absolutely gonna be driven by folks like yourselves and the initiative at, at, uh, at Sankofa Farm. So thank you guys again for, for coming up and sharing with all of us, and, and, and thank you all for the, the, for the positive re reaction. And now, welcome Senator Mitt Romney, here with Atlantic staff writer, McKay Coppins. Senator, McKay. thank you for being with us. <laughs> thank you. Um, Not much going on today, so. No, it's a boring day, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure the first thing you wanted to do was be up on stage and answer questions about it. Um, we have a lot of issues we want to talk about today, but obviously I think we'd be remiss if we don't start with the news. Um, the White House just released the call summary uh, between President Trump and the President of Ukraine. What, what was your reaction? You've read it, I assume? I have. Uh, my reaction was the same as I had uh, a few days ago, which is uh, this remains deeply troubling, and uh, uh, we'll see where it leads, but uh, the, the first reaction is uh, troubling. Was it, get some support for that. In, in the summary that we saw, did that amount to a quid pro quo agreement or at least the implication of a quid pro quo in your view? Uh, I, I don't know that uh, I've focused so much on the quid pro quo element as perhaps some do. Um, uh, there's just the question of, and I, I said this in my first reaction, which is, if the President of the United States uh, asks or presses the leader of a foreign country to carry out an investigation of a political nature, uh, that's troubling. 
and, uh, and I feel that. Um, and so, cl clearly, if there were a quid pro quo, that would uh, take it to an entirely uh, a, a more extreme level. But in your mind, it's, it's, it's serious either way. You're essentially alone among Republican officials in, in expressing concern over this. So I do think it's worth articulating why you think it's so serious. And, and also, why do you think so many of your fellow Republicans have, have been either quiet on this, this subject or actively defending the president? Well, there's, there's such enormous power associated with being the party in power, both in the White House as well as in the, in the Senate and the House. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, people know that in the House because you can pass all the bills you want if your party's in power, but also in the Senate, even though it requires 60 votes to actually get any legislation through. Um, if you're the majority leader, you get to decide what we vote on. And, uh, and it's extraordinary power. And so it's, I think it's very natural for people to, to look at circumstances and see them in the light that's most uh, uh, amenable to their maintaining power hmm. and, uh, and doing things to, to preserve their power. And I think part of that is that both, both parties feel very deeply that if the other party were in charge, that terrible things would happen for the country and for the people, and that it's critical for them to hold on to their leadership so that those awful things that Bernie Sanders is talking about won't come to pass. And, and so, um, I mean, I think it's just in human nature to, uh, to see things in a way that is consistent with your own worldview and, and your, your sense of what's necessary for the preservation of your, your, uh, uh, your position of power. Um, I, I don't know why I'm not in, afflicted to the same degree uh, as perhaps others are in that regard. Maybe it's because I'm old um, and have done other <laughs> there things. There are no other old senators, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One senator said, hey, welcome to the, the club here. It's a club for old men. So uh, I fit right in. But, but I mean, just to get back to that, you know, you're describing partisanship that's been with us for a long time, but at some point, Congress is supposed to hold the executive branch accountable, right? There has to be a level of accountability. You are out there uh, at least expressing concern and saying that there should be some accountability for these actions. What kind of accountability do you think the president should face given what you've learned so far? What should the consequences be? Well, the consequences are being considered by the House, and, uh, and I'm not going to give advice to Speaker Pelosi. She's going to do whatever she thinks is in the best interest of the country and in the best interest of her position of power and her party, uh, and, uh, and she's pursuing that. We'll see where that leads. There will be additional information that comes out as the whistleblower is heard from. The Senate is doing what I think is right, which is uh, insisting that the whistleblower appear before the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, uh, and so more information will come uh, from that front. Could this, in your view, rise to an impeachable offense? Um, I, I think it's, um, uh, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at what I've said <laughs> and, uh, and, let, uh, and let the process gather the facts that, uh, that will ultimately come out. Okay, I might try to come back to you on that, but for now, um, <laughs> let me ask you about this. When you, were, when you expressed concern about this a, a couple days ago, a few days ago, uh, President Trump responded by tweeting a video about you losing the presidential election in, in 2012. Um, so, first of all, you know, what was that like? Um, but, but I think more, more specifically, you, you know, the president has done this with a lot of his critics, um, and specifically Republicans who, who aren't towing the party line in his view. He tries to kind of publicly humiliate them in some way. Do you think that that has a chilling effect on uh, your fellow Republicans' ability or, or willingness to speak out? Well, in my case, I'd forgotten I lost, so it was a helpful <laughs> reminder. Um, and uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the case of other people, I, it's hard for me to know what impact it has, but I think people have to recognize that if you, if you pick a fight with someone on Twitter, for, uh, perhaps, and you have 5,000 followers, and the person you pick a fight with has, I don't know, 25 million followers, that it's likely to be an unfair fight. Uh, and, and whether that shapes people's uh, uh, language or how they react, I don't know, but I think most people try and act out of a self-interest element to a certain degree, and I'm, I'm sure that's, uh, that's at play. It, it doesn't seem to have rattled you necessarily. Why is that? Um, don't you know, say because you're old. No, it's not, it's not so much. I mean, part of it is just the home I grew up in. I grew up with a, a mom and a dad that had very strong personal convictions and uh, expressed those convictions without reservation. 
I, I grew up in that setting, and that's sort of my view of, of what a real person does, what a real American does, is to express their, their views as they have them and not to worry about the consequences. Uh, I, I also think perhaps um, uh, it's related to the fact that I had a life outside of politics. I do not define myself by how I do in campaigns. My, my career was in business. Uh, my, uh, my passion is my family and my faith. So I define myself more in terms of my family, my faith, uh, my career, and, and I'm at a point in life where I'm doing what I think is, is an important contribution, hopefully, but, uh, but I, don't, I don't feel enormous angst by how I'm viewed or even, by the way, by losing an election. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, this is, uh, uh, and so whether it's, you know, in, in my family's uh, upbringing or just those other elements of my life, I, I don't know, but it doesn't bother me not to be real popular. Maybe that reminds me of high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you mentioned your faith, uh, which I actually share. And I'm curious about Utah. You know, Utah is a kind of idiosyncratic state uh, in its politics. It's very conservative, uh, very Republican, but the, the voters there have had kind of a, uh, a, a tumultuous uh, relationship with, with President Trump. Um, Trump won that state, but with a plurality of the vote, uh, his approval ratings have lagged behind in that state, other states. Why is it that you think that Utahns, and, and particularly Latter-day Saints, uh, are, are not as excited uh, to support this president? Um, I, I think uh, people of faith have responded to the president in different ways. And, uh, and some people of faith, as you know, in, 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 in certain streams of religious thought, uh, celebrate everything about the president, every aspect of his life and, and how he speaks and tweets and, and what he does. All those things are terrific and they love it and they support it. In, in my faith, uh, and the people I talk to in Utah generally, there are a, a, a great number of Republicans, overwhelming number of Republicans support the president. But they're very concerned about some of the personal behavior and the tweets and, and wish he wouldn't do some of the things he does. And I hear that a lot. Um, and so they will vote for the president. They're supportive of the president. I think most Republicans in my state are irritated at me for uh, not getting with the team. It's like, all right, he may be an SOB, but he's our SOB, you know? And, and uh, so why aren't you with the team? And why are you critical? Why, you know, just talk about those things in private. Um, there are, you know, I have a, a strong following among about, you know, a slice of pie, pie that big, all right? And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, why is that? I, th I, I don't know precisely, although uh, in, in my faith, people go to church every Sunday. They've been listening to sermons about honesty, integrity, uh, treating people with respect. They've been hearing about that all their life. And, uh, <laughs> I, some of that apparently sinks in. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about your relationship with the president since you've gotten to Washington. Obviously, uh -huh. uh, you've been critical of him. I think right when you uh, entered the Senate, you wrote an op-ed uh, saying that you were going to speak out on matters of character, especially when it comes to this president. Have you been to the Oval Office? What, what have your interactions been like with President Trump since you've gotten to Washington? Uh, they've been cordial so far. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, and, and I was, uh, Lindsey Graham and I went over for, uh, for lunch with the president to, uh, and so we sat in the Oval Office and spoke uh, there for a while, and then we went into a little lunchroom to the side of the Oval Office, and uh, we were talking about, uh, about tariffs, and I expressed my view that the tariffs on aluminum and steel I thought were counterproductive, were hurting our industries more than they were hurting others, and I didn't like tariffs on friends at all. Um, but I said, look, I support what you're doing on China. I think it's a good idea to push back on them. I, I said that I wished he would have done that with the support of our friends around the world, because mm -hmm. I thought that would give us more clout in getting the Chinese to move. But nonetheless, calling China for the uh, cheater it is in terms of uh, global economic policies, I thought was the right thing to do, and I would support him in that regard. Uh, so we had a cordial uh, conversation, and I, you know, I spoke with him just a couple of days ago about another matter, and that was uh, background check legislation. And, and I, I called and asked if he could give me a ring back. He called back shortly thereafter, and I uh, encouraged uh, him to give close consideration to enhancing our background check uh, capacity. And, uh, and so, so it's a, you know, but but I'm sure 
I'm sure he has a cordial relationship with Nancy Pelosi as well, but, but he, may not, he, he may not appreciate all the things she says or does. And I'm sure, I'm sure he disagrees with some of the things I've said, and, 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 uh, um, but he's, you know, he, he's willing to have that conversation. How that continues, I don't know. But uh, you know, I'll continue to, to do what I know isn't popular because my Democrat friends say, why are you, you're voting for him on this policy and that policy? It's like, yeah, but those are policies I agree with. Those are the policies I campaign for. So I agree with those policies. I'll vote with him on those things. I'll vote for his appointments too because those are good people in my opinion. And as a president, you have the right to select the cabinet you want and the appointees you have unless they're really you know, off the, the mark. Um, but if you say or do something which I think is highly destructive or damaging to our national unity, then that's something I feel I've got to speak about. I mean, it's basically if the if the captain of your team says something really offensive, if you don't say anything, it suggests that you, you go along with it. And uh, I'm a Republican, he's the captain of the team, uh, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll be with the team, but not when we say something of that nature. Um, I wanna get to guns in a second, which is something you just brought up, but first, yeah. in 2012, you, uh, you famously said that Russia was our greatest geopolitical foe. Mm -hmm. um, you were mocked by a lot of people in Washington at the time, uh, who have, I think, since come around to maybe you being onto something there. Um, <laughs> yeah, more recently, though, you've said that you now believe that China is our greatest geopolitical foe. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that, and is the administration's approach, you, you talked about this a little bit, but is the approach working? Is the administration's approach to China working? Um, well, first of all, I think Russia was the geopolitical adversary. Uh, they were poking us in the eye everywhere in the world, every bad actor they were supporting. And I think they continue to be motivated by one, well, by an overarching goal, which is just to bring down the United States of America any way they can. Uh, and, uh, but, but long term, uh, I mean, Russia's population is declining. Uh, we really don't buy anything from Russia that I can think of other than energy. Uh, natural resources, so they're not really a long-term uh, challenge to us. The greater challenge is that, that, that China is on a path uh, which suggests a much stronger economy than ours, a much larger military capacity than ours, uh, and, uh, and, and a geopolitical uh, uh, adversary of some capability, and perhaps even more, they would like to be more powerful than we. So they represent a greater threat uh, long-term. Hopefully we can dissuade them from that course. The, the president has, in my view, taken the first right step, which is to say, stop, China, you can't keep doing it. We're not going to let you keep doing this. We're not going to let you take over the South China Sea with impunity. We're going to run our ships through there. Uh, we're not going to let you continue to steal our technology, drive our companies out of business. We're going to push on that. I, I, and, I, and so I applaud that effort, and it was not done under prior administrations. That said, I don't think we have a comprehensive, effective strategy to confront China and to dissuade them from a course which would be counter to a, a course where they're a participant in a, in a world where we share certain values and economic principles and human right principles. And, uh, and I don't blame the president or the administration for that. I just think it's difficult for us to put that together. We, we did that during the Cold War. George Kennan and his, his view ultimately became the, the, the strategy for the nation. In this case, it's complex, but China does have a strategy and it's really, it's really extraordinary. I mean, one, we're gonna manage our own people by watching everything they do and giving them credit scores based on their, their, their civic scores, rather, based on you know, how supportive they are of the government. And then around the world, we're gonna send uh, faculty members to teach in universities all over the world, and we'll pay for them in Confucius Institutes so we can change public attitudes in these nations that might otherwise confront us. And then we're going to build an enormous military, but we're not going to tell you exactly what we're doing. We're not going to report our spending or what we have. And then on an industrial policy basis, we're going to pick key industries of the future. It's not hard to pick out what the industries of the future are. And then we're going to invest in those heavily, and we're going to subsidize them and drive the foreign competition out of business. I mean, it's, and the list goes on. They've got a very clear strategy with a clear goal, and we're, we're taking the first step. I applaud the first step, but we haven't done, done the rest yet. I want to move on in the time we have left to a couple of uh, legislative areas that you're pursuing. One, you mentioned guns. Um, you know, gun violence has been one of the ongoing uh, tragic stories in American life for a long time now. 
And I think there's a lot of frustration out there that Washington has not been able to do anything about it. You're new to the Senate, relatively speaking. Do you see any areas of bipartisan agreement uh, or potential bipartisan agreement that could actually have make a difference in the gun violence problem in America? Um, two things. One, I think a very effective background check technology and an insistence that in, any commercial sale must uh, accompany a or must be accompanied by a background check. I think that would make a difference. I don't know how big, but I think it would make some difference and is something we ought to do. And and there's uh, uh, legislation to that effect, as you uh, know. Toomey and and Joe Matchin have a piece of legislation. Uh, they're looking at ways to deal with some of the complicating features, like how do you deal with somebody who lives a long, long, long way from a gun store that wants to get a background check, but you know it require a 200-mile drive for them to do so. So there's some questions like that they're trying to deal with, but that that's an approach I think will make a difference. You're open to voting for Manchin to me? I, I, yeah, I, the principle of that is something I would support. Uh, we'll see what the final legislation looks like, but that's I'm inclined to support that. Um, then there's something else, which is over the last decade there've been about 450 uh, murders associated with. Um, um, uh, bias and, uh, uh, and, and, and hatred of some kind. And of those, 73% were carried out by white supremacists. And so a much more concerted effort to deal with extremism in our own country uh, could have a significant impact. What would that look like? Well, as in all things, it starts at the top. It means, it means real effort on the part of the administration and the president himself to re really speak out aggressively against any kind of bias against individuals as a result of their, their race, their creed, their sexual orientation, their religion, and so forth. That's, I mean, that, that starts there. And extreme care in, in how we as, as uh, leaders of all kinds, university presidents, pastors, parents, how we talk about and interact with our kids and others uh, about issues of that nature, I think that, I think that has an impact. But that, you know, 73% of these, these uh, murders based upon bias are by white supremacists. This is, the, this is a real terrorist threat at home. Do you, do you think there's a danger in certain elements of the more mainstream uh, political right in America flirting with white supremacy or engaging with oh, it? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Have you I mean, seen that? Um, well, we all watch the news. We all uh, we see what's on TV. But I think, I think uh, there have been individuals who said things that I think are, encourage a, a degree of racism. And, uh, and, and without question, that's a real problem, in a, in a, given the consequence of such a thing. I mean, we are, you know, people love to say our diversity is our strength. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I don't disagree with that. Um, but, but for those who don't think that's the case, for those who wish we could be like Japan, where all the people are of the same ethnicity, Recognize we aren't Japan. We are diverse. We're a highly diverse nation. We're going to become more diverse as time goes on. Like it or not, we must be united as a nation if we're going to remain the, the leader of the world and if we're going to preserve freedom in the world against an authoritarian regime in, in China and, by the way, Russia joining in with them. There, I mean, there's a battle going on right now between those nations that believe in individual freedom and economic freedom and those that believe in authoritarianism. And the only way we win is if America remains strong, number one, and that means united. So this becomes a high priority for us to maintain our unity. And by the way, the only way a small nation, ours, 330 million, competes long term with a big nation, 1.4 billion China, is by linking arms with our friends around the world. Mm. What distinguishes us, um, what, one of the many things that distinguishes us in a geopolitical sense from China is that we have a lot of friends, and they don't have friends. We've got a lot of friends. It's a huge advantage. So taking advantage of our friendships, economically, militarily, geopolitically, fostering those things, trying, I mean, I want to see a strong Europe. I want Europe extraordinarily strong. I want them robust and growing, and, and I want to be linked as much as we can because we're confronting a, a competitor uh, unlike anything we've seen. I mean, the old Soviet Union was belligerent, but extraordinarily weak. The new competitor, China, is extraordinarily strong. Not as belligerent as the old Soviet Union was, but extraordinarily strong. And, uh, and getting them to, to take a course which makes them a, 
a partner on the world stage and not an adversary is very much in the interest of freedom. So if one of the concerns that you have about America's kind of fracturing and divisions that weakens the country is racism and, uh, and other forms of bigotry or prejudice, what do you think, how, how should we approach Im immigration when it comes to that? You know, I think a lot of people would say that the way President Trump setting a policy aside the way he talks about immigrants, the way he talks about immigration, uh, would encur encourage his racist attitudes, xenophobic attitudes. Um, what, do, do you think that's true? And either way, do you believe that there is a way to fix the immigration system without uh, demonizing immigrants? Uh, certainly, and I think it's most unfortunate when any political person uh, says things which can be interpreted as demonizing people based upon their immigration status or, uh, or their race, religion, and so forth. And uh, do we have an answer there? Yeah, we, we need immigration. Our country needs legal immigration. We've got to have it. Uh, I say that, we all talk about, we all talk about, we want GDP growth. We want, and it's like most people wonder what the heck is GDP anyway, but we want GDP growth. GDP growth is a mathematical function of two things. One is output per worker, and the other is number of workers. So if, you, if your number of workers is going down because you're shrinking as a population, and the U.S. population will shrink without immigration. So if you want GDP growth, which is a good thing, by the way, you want to have more people come into our country. You want people come into our country. And we celebrate people coming in legally. It's not impossible to find a system that works. I happen to think that a a mandatory e-verify system, meaning employers must check e-verify when they hire someone. And if they hire someone that's here illegally, you sanction the employer, not the employee, the employer. You put penalties on them. So uh, this uh, immigration is not rocket science, politically challenging, but not rocket science. We got other problems like China. That's tough. That's really tough. Healthcare, that's really tough. But immigration, this is not a tough one, and we need a deal to get done where what Republicans are concerned about, what Democrats are concerned about, we're able to give each side something so it's a win. I mean, one of the things you recognize, you all do, is that in Washington, for something to happen, it must be seen as a win for both parties. And, and this is not real hard. So a deal only gets done when it's going to be good and a win for both parties. LBJ when he put in the, uh, uh, fostered the Civil Rights Act, gave credit to Everett Dirksen. Get Republicans on this, make this a joint success. You have to do the same. So my last question as we wrap up, is there any likelihood, any possibility of deals like that getting done while impeachment is looming over Washington? Uh, I think it's very difficult for deals to get done right now. Anytime even during a, a, an election cycle, it's very hard to get deals done. And I think this only adds to the uh, a difficulty of, of making progress. So it's, uh, uh, and now, you know, Will Rogers used to say that, that you weren't safe whenever Congress was in session. And, and uh, he, he'd amend that now. He said, you're, you're safe even when Congress is in session. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's gonna be hard to get some of these things done. But a number of us are still fighting and hoping to get some things done, which are wins for both sides and wins for the American people. Senator Romney, thank you for your time. Thanks, you, Thank you. Please welcome back Margaret Lowe. So uh, don't go away because there's more to come. Uh, I'm actually here between a senator and a singer. Um, that was a pretty fascinating take on the experience of one prominent Republican at this very fractious moment in history. Um, the reason I decided to sneak in here between Mitt Romney and our closer for the morning is so that I wouldn't lose you all in the rush to lunch. Um, so first, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about the food. Um, I'm happy to report that there is a lot of it. Uh, and you shouldn't miss our Food for Thought lunches, which will feature conversations on everything from the race to the right, White House to Boris, Brexit, and the future of Britain. If you want to break from politics, there are discussions about animals and the DC food scene. And the Atlantic's in-house therapist, Lori Gottlieb, will be downstairs here at the Harmon to talk about her book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. All the details, of course, are on your festival app. And as always, our team is flooding the zone to help you find your way. And we're going to be back here at 2 o'clock sharp for a conversation with Disney CEO Bob Iger and Emerson Collective's Lorene Powell Jobs. 
So I'm glad you're all still sitting here. You're in for a treat. It is my great pleasure to welcome Sarah Shepard from the cast of the Broadway musical, Beautiful. <laughs> 